Okay. Shall we get started? Yeah, I think so. Great. All right. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the Triple AI 2021 tutorial on principles and uh, strategies of uh, distributed machine learning. Uh, today, we're going to talk about simplifying distributed machine learning via composable automated parallel machine learning systems. Uh, the presenter of uh, today's tutorial will be the following. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Hao Zhang from uh, UC Berkeley. He is currently a postdoc at UC Berkeley and also a research scientist and the technical leader at Petum. The second presenter is uh, Auric Chow, a PhD student from, P uh, from Carnegie Mellon University and also a senior engineering leader at Petum. The third presenter is uh, Dr. Chi Ronghu, who was graduated from CMU and currently the co-founder and the uh, uh, CTO of Petum. I am Eric Xing. Uh, I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon, and recently I actually moved to Abu Dhabi to be the president of a new university known as the Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence. I remain the founder and the chairperson of uh, Petum. Uh, actually, I want to make a little bit of advertisement of my new job. Uh, this new university is going to be working on AI and uh, I had the great pleasure to lead this uh, new initiative. If uh, you want to be working with a president who is actually still doing research and actively presenting research, you can definitely send resumes for job applications and the student applications. We are actively hiring at all level for faculty and the students. So with that, uh, we're going to start the presentation. So today's topic is about uh, a particular aspect of artificial intelligence, which is uh, very much in line with the major theme of our AAA conference. As we all know, you know, uh, uh, AI is not everywhere in the media. You know, there has been a lot of uh, progress made over the past uh, many years, a few years, in fact, you know, in AI innovation. And today we see a lot of amazing applications in different areas. Here are just some examples of uh, those uh, major uh, milestones of uh, accomplishments. In particular, recently, AI models, a transform model was even used to model protein structures so that you can use it for drug design. And uh, previously, we see applications of AI in smart city applications for you know, tracking and uh, facial recognition, in uh, playing the game of Go, in robotics, in generating content, and so forth. So all these different applications each pose very interesting challenges in new algorithmic design and also in uh, new theoretical foundations. But uh, almost all of these uh, new innovations and advancements are also coming hands in hands with uh, new and larger models. And this remains and uh, represents you know, a major trend also in AI and machine learning. Here we see the curve of uh, the growth of uh, size, you know, and the computing, uh, you know, you know, uh, burden or, or a work workload, you know, over the years with the different machine learning models, and there is a growing trend for model complexity, data size, uh, and also the training cost, and there has been a lot of challenges in recent years, you know, uh, for training this uh, very powerful and uh, uh, and advanced models that requires lots of computation, lots of memory, and uh, you know, many technical uh, innovations to parallelize and distribute those machine learning training tasks. Uh, for a researcher, a standard and typical researcher in artificial intelligence, uh, many researchers will take for granted that the hardware and the computing infrastructure needs you know, are either uh, solved by money or covered by admin or you know, system administrator. And some people even believe that uh, this uh, new era of advanced AI research belongs to the territory of uh, bigger companies or who own large infrastructure. But uh, uh, it is actually important for all of us to realize that uh, we are all part of uh, 
you know, uh, the players in this uh, uh, major campaign, and we may be also uh, facing an opportunity to be contributing solutions to all the challenges we face. For example, hidden beneath the cost of AI and complexity of AI systems, you know, there are you know, additional issues that is uh, beyond you know, economical factors or technical factors. Here, you know, I just want to raise a few of them. For example, you know, we heard many uh, 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 progressive politicians and the environmentalists are advocating for you know, uh, green development. Like you, you are discouraged to take air flights. You are not supposed to cut trees, but uh, are you supposed to also do Google search and uh, tweet, you know, uh, tweets every day? In fact, all these activities uh, also cause, you know, a environmental footprint. In fact, they may be more costly. And here, I just want to give you maybe a few examples. For example, the kind of uh, AI models that uh, we deal with, you know, on a routine basis, say, you know, a specific transformer model, a standard transform model published in some of our literatures, their training costs cannot be ignored. You know, a typical model could cost the energy equivalent to, you know, a few thousand cars driving a few hundred miles. And if you train such a model on a single GPU, it actually will cost you, you know, a couple hundred years to complete, you know, taking this amount of much amount of energy. So this is an untrivial, you know, carbon footprint. And by the way, this is just one model training for one time. And uh, we researchers often need to retrain our model to improve performance, to adapt to different locations. And say we train it a hundred times, that quickly can boost, you know, the, the cost of the model to, you know, an, a few, you know, dozen millenniums of uh, years in time. And also the energy consumption can maybe even power, you know, uh, a few thousand homes, which is equivalent to a small city. For advanced models, such as uh, BERT and the GPT-3, their number of parameters, you know, are often two or uh, one or two magnitude larger than the standard transform models I just mentioned. For example, here, you know, according to the report, the GPT-3, you know, model at OpenAI has uh, 175 billion parameters. Training such a model could easily, you know, uh, lead to, you know, the consumption of uh, so much energy, which uh, can be enough to power, you know, a few hundred thousand homes, which is equivalent to a small city for a whole year. So this is a huge, you know, uh, cost on the environment and uh, on the community beyond what money can cover, right? And here we're just talking about the training cost. If we're talking about uh, the cost of internet activity, say, you know, uh, inference and uh, and uh, say advertisement and recommendation, you know, they actually can be uh, sometimes uh, measured, uh, you know, uh, in a rough kind of a quantity that uh, indicates a, you know, 3.7% of a global greenhouse emission, which is uh, quite astonishing. And uh, the amount of uh, water you can use to cool, you know, the data center can also be huge. Therefore, there is a need really to look at the cost of AI. And now one of the major solution towards reducing the cost of AI is to figure out how to train model more efficiently with a better design of the infrastructure. And that is the major topic of today. In fact, you know, uh, to by and large to the AI community, the cost of AI, the infrastructure complexity of AI is uh, typically considered to be you know, uh, invisible from our daily solution. We usually see the AI solution as the tip of the iceberg, where you see algorithms, solutions, predictions, but beneath that, you have to also deal with a, a long list of uh, system-oriented issues, such as, uh, you know, uh, uh, network pro protocols, fault recoveries, model versioning, debugging, and all that. These are not only technically difficult, but also it requires, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, knowledge and also training to get the right people to handle it. And also the solution to many of these problems is also very, very diverse. Here is a snapshot of uh, uh, what we see as uh, the machine learning marketplace, where you see 
you know, uh, names like uh, prompt server uh, and the uh, gradient quantization uh, and the uh, different type of uh, uh, communication and the bridging protocols. And then all these uh, acronyms standing for various design of specific systems invented for handling a particular type of model or a particular type of data uh, in a particular type of environment. So this is a very complex you know, space for people to uh, understand and to also make appropriate choices for specific problems in hand. A few of these systems are universal in handling more than one or two problems. So it's a maze, very, very hard for people to navigate. Depending on your specific expertise and the creativity, you know, the system that has been built is typically a bespoke system dedicated you know, uh, for a particular problem, which is more like a piece of art, you know, coming out of uh, a, uh, say, a, you know, a, uh, a craftsmanship rather than a systematic engineering. And imagine that uh, you want to run a airport, uh, which uh, has to, you know, uh, land and take off different type of aircraft. What we are doing right now in the system ML domain is more or less closer to building a specific runway for a specific aircraft, which can cause a very, very messy and expensive, uh, you know, uh, overall, uh, uh, you know, uh, compilation of uh, solutions if we have to take off or land a large number of different aircrafts. Therefore, you know, uh, in today's uh, proposed uh, tutorial, we are going to uh, discuss the foundation and uh, the design toward a compositional approach to machine learning systems, where we bring in standardization and, uh, uh, and the library and also uh, uh, specific assemblage tools and uh, protocols to build you know, versatile and uh, repurposable systems from standardized and reusable building blocks. We envision the following transition of uh, old school system machine learning practice on the left to a modern practice, you know, that is a lot more elegant and clean and sustainable, you know, by compositionality. So with that, we're going to bring you into the uh, a sequence of uh, topics discussing strategies and the principles of digital machine learning. Here are the list of uh, topics we're going to go through by uh, the speakers I just introduced. We're going to first discuss some first principles, which are the mathematical foundations for building the distributed machine learning systems. And then based on those foundations and first principles, we're going to introduce a system of uh, representations, a systematic representations of uh, elements needed for designing different strategies of uh, distributed machine learning. And then we are going to discuss composition of a system using all these elements from uh, a one-off to an adaptive uh, system solution. And the next, we're going to also discuss uh, another level up of uh, adaptiveness and flexibility, which is to schedule different resources, you know, toward, you know, uh, a compilation of uh, multiple tasks on specific system architecture and configuration so that the system and the algorithm can co-adaptive to each other to accommodate maximum amount of workflow. And finally, we're going to discuss also uh, several new ways of measuring the goodness of system, which uh, turns our first principle into uh, you know, uh, uh, meeting the need of applicability you know, in real world. So I will be opening the tutorial by covering the first principles or the mathematic foundations of uh, designing distributed systems. And then Chirong and uh, Hao and Auric uh, will each take on to cover the subsequent topics. Okay, first principle is always uh, you know, a very important starting point for any you know, uh, you know, systematic uh, you know, uh, work and design. And uh, in the system, uh, very often, uh, we don't hear too much discussion about the mathematical foundation for the machine learning task. So here I'm going to take a few minutes to have a quick recap about what kind of problems 
you know, that uh, a cis ML prop, uh, you know, uh, engineering solution has to address. So here is a machine program, which is actually the core problem every system has to face, right? There are nowadays many different machine learning programs, depending on what type of models and what type of data you use, you may run into training a transformer, you may need to, you know, work on co-attention models, or you may even go to the old school solution on regressions, random forests, other things. But all of this can be elegantly described by a mathematical formula. Here, you know, we just put a one-on-one version of such a formula, which is uh, 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 signifying, uh, you know, a loss function, uh, a set of data, and also the set of parameters. And typically for any machine learning program, the goal is to optimize, you know, uh, against this uh, loss function uh, by finding the best configurations of the parameters using the training data, which of course, you know, uh, turn the loss function into a specific uh, numerical quantity that you can minimize or optimize. And typically the program used to do this uh, uh, parameter estimation is uh, not a uh, closed form solution, but a fixed point iteration, which we often call an iterative convergent program that looks like this. You know, through a for loop, we are going to repetitively do the following, where a old version of the parameters together with uh, an increment in which depends on the data and on the shape of the function will be, you know, integrated to give rise to a newer version of the parameters. This particular algorithm actually has an important implication to the way we design our systems, which I'm going to discover uh, discuss in a second. But just to give you a few examples about how general this formula can be. Recently, we actually uh, had another line of research, you know, uh, 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 you know su suggesting that uh, many of the existing machine learning paradigms, including the standard maximum likelihood estimation, but also covering uh, generative adversarial networks, reinforcement learning, active learning, and so on, can all be integrated into a programmatic machine learning framework described by the following standard equation, where loss functions can be composed by introducing different experience functions, divergence functions, and so forth. So therefore, you can have a large room uh, space of uh, flexibility in designing this particular target function depending on what task you use. And then the model architecture nowadays also enjoy a huge library of uh, building blocks, typically, you know, uh, deep learning style building blocks that can allow you to, you know, comp compose very, comp very powerful uh, model structures. And then the algorithm is uh, typically still a alternating gradient descent algorithm that uh, is to be carried out and computed by the system. Then focusing on this particular step, you know, we will see very obviously the need of uh, the digital machine learning, you know, showing up, you know, given the current development trend I just described. For example, when the model and uh, the data are becoming large, that pretty much means that this data and the D become so large that it is becoming inconvenient, you know, to be encapsulated in each iteration as a computing message or they are too big to fit into the memory of a single machine and so forth. Therefore, you have to use uh, uh, multiple machines to jointly compute either this update or this uh, aggregation by dividing the bigger theta or the bigger D into pieces. And that leads to additional questions on efficiency, correctness, and their trade-offs, you know, effort and time and, uh, you know, uh, skill sets needed to do these things correctly. And also in, very, uh, in some new scenarios, there is often also you know, a, uh, a need uh, to uh, maybe uh, implement a distributed program for a practical limitation. In a, for example, federated AI setting, your data are simply not available in a centralized fashion. Therefore, your algorithm has to go to different uh, locations uh, or different uh, geographic uh, you know, uh, spots, you know, to handle a subset of data and then, you know, undergoing a, uh, 
uh, iterative program to get updates, right? So all these are calling for the needs for distributed machine learning system and the algorithm. A distributed machine learning algorithm and the strategy typically has to address the following list of aspects. First, it has to figure out in a distributed setting, what kind of a quantity needs to be computed. For example, the message that you need to compute to encode any updates, and also the aggregates you have to compute to you know, uh, finish the updates and aggregate all the information from different uh, nodes in a network structure. You also need to discuss and uh, figure out how to do communication correctly, because now you are not only using one machine to do the work, but also many machines. Therefore, how the machine talk to each other and uh, what do they talk about and uh, how to synchronize you know, the communication among machines becomes an interesting you know, white space of research. And thirdly, you need to you know, uh, work out how to do memory management you know, in terms of uh, which part of the memory you know, store which fraction of the data and uh, how to you know, uh, you know, refresh the contents inside the memory uh, in conjunction with uh, computational updates and so forth. So imagine multiple options in each of these dimensions, you are already facing a big design space for you to come up with uh, the optimal combination suitable for your computational needs. So what do we mean now by designing the best strategy? Because uh, uh, we are facing a particular type of computation, which is known as machine learning, that is uh, uh, quite unique, you know, compared to our conventional computational task. In the old days of uh, distributed computing, in fact, distributed computing is a very classical topic, you know, in operating system. And uh, in the good old days, uh, this kind of uh, research are targeting towards uh, also large scale tasks, but those tasks is uh, often known as uh, operational centric, meaning that uh, they are deterministic programs where the highest priority is to make sure that there are equivalence between a sequential program and a distributed program. Here I have an example. Suppose that you are sorting, say, a long list of numbers, say a million numbers, and you have 10 computers. So it's natural to divide uh, this long list into 10 chunks and having each one to do local sorting and then combine results. Imagine a mistake happened in one of the sorter. And uh, then this mistake can easily propagate into the bigger solution if, do, if you don't solve it. It's like a building you know, a Lego in a deterministic fashion. One mistake happening whenever needs to be correct on the spot before it's propagated into the whole system. Right? So that's a type of uh, you know, computational task we used to deal with in digital computing. But uh, if we take a close look at machine learning, it is a very different task. It is dominated by an equation of this kind, which is uh, meant to optimize a loss function. You know, what does optimization mean? It's more like climbing a mountain or a hill. Imagine this climber who wants to climb to the top of this mountain. Does it even matter he follows a particular path or make every particular step accurate as design or they can have a flexibility of a moving in a zigzag fashion or even more flat fashion as long as he gets to the top. Right? So this is an interesting question because the goal of uh, training machine learning models is uh, optimization centric instead of operation centric. The operation, say each update step is just you know, a vehicle to achieve the optimization target, but it is not the only way to achieve that. Therefore, there are flexibilities in realizing machine learning programs. If you take a more close look, you will discover many other unique properties of machine learning program, which uh, may be exploited for more efficient distributed machine learning. For example, it is well known that uh, machine learning algorithms such as a stochastic gradient descent is uh, error tolerant. You can sometimes make a mistake, you know, by you know uh, either uh, you know uh, you know uh, working on a subset of the data or even the wrong data points, but still you know, uh, avoid missing the final target because the later updates will be able to correct earlier mistakes. There are also this phenomenon known as uh, ununiform convergence, meaning that uh, when you are simultaneously solving a large number of parameters, 
not all of them are converging at the equal speed. Some may converge faster and some may converge later. Therefore, you could uh, have the flexibility of uh, redeploying your computational resources for parameters which are converging slower. Right? Also, there are structures among parameters. Not all the parameters are independent of each other. Sometimes they act in groups. And by grouping them together, you may avoid you know, a uh, uh, very uh, harmful interference or, or inconsistency among parameters. Also, good practice of tuning can often speed up or sometimes cause slowdown you know, of uh, the computation in machine learning. Uh, when you choose the good learning rates, the batch size, sometimes you get a big reward by converging faster. And this is, again, another opportunity in system design. And last but not least, nowadays while working with the bigger models, for example, the major uh, model underlying a transformer consists of uh, attention heads, right? And the uh, receptive uh, you know, uh, convolution nets and the many other components. And uh, do they have to be all trained end to end together or they can be trained separately and then assemble? So these are all very interesting questions which could impact the design of the systems. Therefore, we want to you know, establish this uh, uh, belief that uh, the system design for machine learning is uh, solving a optimization centric problem, not a transaction centric problem. Therefore, there are different set of uh, loss functions and priorities we have to uh, uh, study compared to our old practice of a parallel machine, a parallel computing. For example, how to define meaningful efficiency. In fact, the efficiency you know, is also a key subject in classical machine learning research, especially the theoretical research of machine learning. This is a typical uh, theoretical results many uh, researchers you know, would like to show for their algorithm, which describe the rate of convergence you know, between you know, uh, uh, two steps you know, uh, you know, using a particular algorithm. And if you inspect this particular you know, uh, you know, convergence uh, you know, bound, you will see that uh, it is very naturally reflecting you know, the time, for example, the number of iterations you have to use, right? The magnitude of uh, the updates. And uh, also there are, you know, uh, coefficients which reflects maybe the shape of the function and so forth. But there is uh, no quantity here reflecting what computational resource you use. Here, computing is a very abstract uh, resource, which is often considered to be ideal and infinite. But in practice, you are working on a computer with a infinite, uh, uh, with a finite amount of memory, finite bandwidth, and even finite uh, number of bits to encode your numbers. Therefore, you actually uh, have you, you have to consider many practical limitations. And uh, when you consider that, what will happen? So here is an interesting experience we had in the past. It's, it happened several years ago. When you, you know, at that time, we were trying to train a large scale topic model. And uh, we tried to do the experiment with a 25 machine, 50 machine, and 100 machine. And after some uh, good practice in engineering, we were able to see almost like a linear increase of uh, the data throughput, meaning that the more machine you use, you know, the more data you can process per unit amount of time, which is almost the linear. But surprisingly, when you actually monitor the speed of convergence of uh, the model, you actually see that uh, when you use larger number of machines, the effectiveness of uh, using data or maybe the rate of convergence per unit volume of data start to decay. Okay, you need to actually you know, process more data to achieve a similar level of uh, objective function values, meaning that uh, you actually are getting low quality return you know, when you process a large amount of data with more machines. That means, you know, more machine isn't necessarily getting your job done. They may, you know, process more data, but at lower quality. What you really want to see happening is that uh, regardless of you use uh, 25 machine, 50 machine or 100 machine, you have uh, the same rate of convergence with respect to the amount of data. Then the higher throughput you obtained from more machines can generate a meaningful reward leading to faster convergence. So our problem is that 
how you achieve that by designing the right system, which ensure that the quality of data processing is not compromised. And that leads to you know, a interesting way of looking into this dichotomy of uh, system evaluation. On the one hand, we'll care about the system throughput, meaning that uh, we need to really reduce the amount of uh, useless computation. For example, the amount of computation used in communicating messages, but wanting all the time to be spent on you know, the computing of the, uh, of the message of updates, say data processing. This is achievable you know, by using you know, appropriate computational protocol to kind of uh, uh, reduce delay and uh, synchronization among machines. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that the statistical efficiency okay, of uh, you know, the updates you know, are still sound and uh, not compromised. Meaning that when you process your data, you, know, you get uh, the same amount of uh, you know, uh, improvement in your loss function when you process the same amount of data, whether you distribute it or centralize it. So these type of questions leads us to study, you know, uh, the principles of strategy so much digital machine learning in a systematic manner, you know, a couple of years ago. At uh, 2016, you know, my team published a paper, which, uh, you know, uh, looked into depths of the issue about how to distribute computation how to bridge computation with uh, inter-machine communications and uh, how to communicate between machines and uh, how to communicate, uh, what to communicate between machines. These questions actually sets the foundation of designing you know, basic digital machine learning systems. Now five years has passed. There has been a lot of uh, developments and uh, I want to just give you a flavor about uh, what you can get out of this uh, fundamental study and what new problems we are facing so that we can move into the bulk of the presentation of the tutorial. You know, a few years ago, many groups simultaneously discovered uh, this uh, very interesting, but uh, very intuitive, uh, you know, system distributed machine learning architecture called the parameter server, right? Which actually uh, consists of uh, three key ideas. One is uh, a idea called uh, the distributed shared memory, utilizing a star topology where a particular you know, a central server is uh, holding, you know, a uh, holy grail copy, a version of the model parameters. And then all the worker machines will be splitting the large amount of data to compute local version of uh, parameter updates and then pass their results to the master where, you know, aggregation are taking place. And then, you know, uh, the parameters gets updated. And naturally this parameter server architecture you know, necessitates the design of a communication protocols to, you know, uh, you know uh, govern the activity between the workers and the masters. And the one of the, you know, uh, the communication protocol or the bridging model is known as the still synchronous parallel uh, protocol where different machines are communicating in a bounded asynchronous version. And then, you know, uh, with uh, this kind of uh, design, one can even conduct a theoretical analysis to understand, to characterize the speed of convergence of uh, the model parameters under this uh, less perfect computational environment. And uh, here is just uh, a snapshot of uh, the main theorem, you know, in one of these papers, which shows that uh, the rate of error uh, reducing over time is going to be determined by a few coefficients in the entire system, which uh, includes you know, the mean of the asynchrony between different machines, the variance of the asynchrony between different machines, in addition to the typical, you know, smooth, you know, uh, coefficients of the loss function and the learning rates and the time. So you can see this bunch for the first time includes both the mathematical property of the function and also the system property of the computational infrastructure. And they together defines how fast, you know, your error is going to converge, uh, how fast your error is going to reduce to zero. Right? So that's the kind of, uh, you know, work you know, uh, taking place in the past uh, several years. And in fact, there has been, you know, a, a huge body of uh, innovations, you know, taking place in the past few years, you know, exploring new ideas in many of these dimensions in the aspect of computing, memory management, 
communication and so forth. And here is just a, a very short list of uh, names of those ideas. Right. You, can, you can imagine these artifacts are really bewildering. It is very, very hard to use and generalize beyond what uh, the original author of those uh, uh, systems were intended to be. You know, a person who uh, are not familiar with uh, the inner fabric and design principles of the systems uh, do have uh, a lot of a hard time you know, in figuring out how to make good use of them. And in fact, you know, not too obviously, but later discovered by practitioners, these existing artifacts, you know, this list, you know, are not always, you know, uh, doing what they promise to deliver. Okay, they have weaknesses. For example, the problem the server, when it runs into, say, uh, models with a very dense, you know, a matrix of parameters, such as uh, a feed forward layers, where, you know, there are, you know, a uh, a dense matrix of parameters to be updated in each iteration, they create a, you know, a bottleneck in this uh, communication network, uh, causing slowing down of the whole system. Another uh, system architecture known as uh, the sufficient factor broadcast, which uh, use a P2P broadcast topology to send lightweight message pairwisely between all machines has been designed to a particular type of uh, 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 models which can be learned through sufficient factors. But it turns out that these type of models also have uh, artifacts, uh, has deficiencies because uh, the complexity or the number of messages that you have to you know, uh, generate in the, in, in the entire system is quadratic to the number of nodes. Therefore, when you build a very big systems, the P2P broadcast protocol quickly you know, uh, and, uh, become very complex and uh, slow. Recently, there is another architect which has been a very uh, popular among many uh, training uh, practices known as the all reduce, right? So in all reduce, uh, what you do is to form a ring topology of all the machines. And then uh, each machine is going to only communicate to its immediate neighbor in this ring. And also it is communicating a random subset of the parameters that it has to compute. But once this uh, ring cycle take place multiple iterations, eventually all the model parameters will be updated. And also all the parameters, uh, all the local machines will have its own copy of the entire model parameters. It is a very effective uh, uh, strategy you know, for many model training tasks. But it turns out that when running into certain type of model, for example, uh, sparse models, uh, where the gradient of updates are sparse and happening you know, in a small subset of uh, uh, parameters uh, out of the entirety. Then the ring topology and strategy fail to update the model timely, which can cause you know, serious computational consequences. Right. So as you can see, it is very hard you know, to find a solution that fits all needs. And it is very often you know, uh, a need to custom made, you know, uh, specific systems, you know, to particular models, which can be very expensive. So we are living in this dichotomy of distributed system design, and we ask, should we really, uh, you know, uh, still pursue, you know, a one size fit for all type of approach, or we have to, you know, uh, live to this uh, custom made expectation that we build solutions for every problem we have to face. So. Today, we are going to uh, take this opportunity to uh, do a revisit of the principles and strategies of uh, distributed machine learning, where we are trying to make a case and also demonstrate uh, uh, some strategies and uh, some thoughts that uh, hopefully uh, can convince us that uh, the more adaptive and the more general purpose uh, uh, principle of system design is perhaps possible with a very uh, thorough and a systematic understanding of the design space of machine learning systems. So to prep that, let me reiterate, of, uh, uh, reiterate our problems to be solved, which is our machine learning program. So this is uh, what I showed earlier, which uh, you know, uh, show explicitly the mathematical entities that has to be translated into the system representation so that they can be either distributed you know, or 
you know, handled in specific, you know, uh, infrastructure uh, dependent manner, loss function, data, and parameters, and this uh, iterative update equation. I like to update uh, the notation a little bit to accommodate uh, what the people often see in the recent publications where the way to refer to parameters, loss, and update equations seems to be evolving from, uh, for example, Greek characters to, you know, uh, Latin characters and so forth. But uh, still, we're dealing with uh, the same uh, type of entities, data parameters and loss functions, each of which can grow arbitrarily complex. And the first concept we want to introduce to uh, prepare us uh, for uh, in-depth investigation is that of uh, a distributed machine learning strategy. So here I introduce a uh, concise definition of what is the strategy. It refers to a standardized operational configuration for a distributed machine learning program that defines a system architect along with the system protocols to be executed and also the message to be computed and communicated by the computing resources. So it's a long sentence. It kind of uh, imply you that a particular machine learning strategy for digital computing is actually a tuple of multiple elements, each of which can be instantiated from a list of options. So here, for example, is uh, you know, a instance of uh, the parameter server strategy, which uh, you know, entails the following instantiations. It needs to choose a particular partition of the model, in this case, a central model with a data partition. It has to settle on a particular topology, in this case, a star topology. It needs to choose a bridge model. It can be a bulk synchronous parallel model, which is in the classical system, and also could be a SSP model, which I just introduced, the, the still synchronous parallel model for partially uh, bounded asynchronous communication. The message needs to be a batch gradient to the server and the aggregation needs to be a summation of all these messages. Right? So this is a very explicit and concise description of what a parameter server entails at the system level. And uh, the usefulness of uh, using such a representation is to allow a concise comparison between different systems and also explore the combination and the grafting and the programming of uh, complex systems as I'm going to show an example. So here I graphically uh, no, uh, repeat the example of parameter server and you can see these uh, five tuples along with their instantiation is uh, coming from specific instances from a library of the choices but it doesn't mean that the same choice cannot be used for other uh, strategy. For example, the uh, particular communication protocol in this case, BSP can be used not just in problem server, but maybe another communication systems. So let's look at another strategy, which is the, the ring or reduce. So in here, the partition becomes a little bit different because uh, in this case, the model needs to be replicated across other nodes, but it is still a data partition, you know, uh, uh, strategy for the data. Uh, therefore, every node will be holding a subset of the data. The topology in this case is uh, not a star, but a ring. And the bridging model remains a BSP. You can see one of the strategy is uh, reused. Therefore, if you want to write a communication program, you don't have to write it twice. It can be write, written once and uh, put it in the library and uh, be caught from different strategies. The message in this case is a batch gradient and the aggregation in this case is uh, not an aggregation of all messages in the entire system, but only those coming from the neighbor message. So to make things more interesting, what you see here, you know, is uh, a, uh, you know, a monolithic strategy uh, dictates the entire system. But, uh, you know, in several recent papers, there has been uh, reports on the so-called uh, hybrid strategies, which entails sub, you know, sub strategies, you know, uh, below, you know, a master design. For example, when computing uh, the 
uh, when, 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 when implementing the learning algorithm of uh, a deep neural network, a CNN, you know, uh, this paper reports that uh, you can use uh, a combination of two strategies at the bottom of the neural network where you need to learn the parameters of the convolution layer. The parameters in the convolution layer are usually sparse because uh, they are uh, redundant, you know, uh, in some of the model weights. Therefore, you know, it is a lightweight update matrix, which can be best served from a parameter server topology or strategy. But uh, in the inner layers of the deep neural network, you now need to deal with a very dense feed forward network and their weights. And, uh, but uh, they are low rank and therefore can be also computed through what is known as the sufficient factors. Therefore, a alternative strategy known as the SFP can be brought in to carry out more effective and, uh, and, uh, and uh, more efficient computation for this part of the model. Therefore, entirely, you are using two strategies, you know, interposed each, uh, in, uh, in, uh, 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 interacting each other, you know, to uh, solve the entire needs of the computing, which leads to actually, you know, a pretty substantial, you know, improvement, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, the convergence speed. Another example uh, was reported from a system known as the parallax. So in here, again, you are training a deep neural network model. Uh, in fact, even you know, uh, more complicated because it entails, it includes both you know, uh, a modular language model and also some other embedding you know, mechanisms you know, facing the real data. And we all know that uh, you know, uh, embedding models you know, uh, has uh, typically uh, used uh, either convolutional structures or other regularities which uh, often uh, has uh, sparsities in their model parameters. Therefore, we can use a parameter server you know, to deal with uh, the computing strategy in a distributed setting. But uh, the language model or other you know, advanced layers you know, uh, you know, uh, in a big learning system may have very complex and uh, dense parameter structure. And in this case, they can best benefit from you know a uh, you know a uh, a all reduced uh, strategy with a ring topology right again this complex compounded structure uh, strategy is uh, you know uh, delivering very good results so with these two system we probably can already envision that uh, system compositionality is perhaps the future of machine system design in which instead of using a monolithic and the best box system built you know, uh, for a particular utility. Instead, we could pursue a more modular and reconfigurable, repurposable and generalizable system like we do in Lego, you know, using pre-made standardized and reusable parts, such as what I just uh, what I just talked about, you know, the different type of uh, bridging protocols, the different type of uh, topologies. You know, we can basically implement uh, each of these instances using very standardized and high efficient code and leave them to be, you know, uh, uh, caught, you know, by different strategies for different composition, right? So this is basically the gist of a compos composable machinery system, which we're going to discuss and demonstrate for the rest of the tutorial. And our goal is to really achieve cost effectiveness, trustworthiness, high performance, and also more importantly, in the future, a unified way of thinking about system design, you know, and understand, you know, uh, you know, without, you know, uh, getting uh, deeply entangled into the, you know, nitty-gritty details of the system implementation, but still understanding what different uh, choices of system configuration can offer in terms of uh, better computational uh, efficiency and also. Uh, 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 preserving, uh, you know, uh, saving of computational cost and improving also the machine learning accessibility to, you know, uh, uh, you know non-system experts and uh, general developers. Before I end up, I also want to point your attention to the importance of uh, defining good measure of goodness, okay, uh, for system design. I already mentioned in the, uh, in the just now that there is a trade-off 
between, for example, the system throughput and uh, the statistical efficiency. And uh, this is a typical curve of trade-off we often run into, you know, in many system artifacts. That actually calls for a need to design a new generation of uh, goodness functions to measure the future design of a computational system. And today we are going to present one of these design, which is known as the good put. It is uh, simply a product of uh, the throughput and the efficiency, okay, in a very, very intuitive way. And each of which is reflecting the influence, you know, uh, it's influenced by different choices of configuration in the system and by combining them into a new type of loss function, we can now more systematically and more deterministically study, you know, the different combinations of uh, system configurations as uh, listed in here. So with that, I'm going to conclude uh, my part of the talk, which uh, gave you a very high level overview of uh, the first principles we want to make use of in thinking about our machine learning system design. And uh, the plan for the next uh, couple of sections is listed in here. We are going to continue with uh, an in-depth review of uh, all the important aspects for distributed machine learning system strategies. And then built on that, we are going to talk about how to build composition analysis for systems uh, in both manual and the automatic way. And we are going to then move on to uh, the topic of how to schedule resources for multiple compositions of such systems. And finally, we will wrap up with uh, some discussions of designing uh, good measurement of goodness for system evaluation. So with that, I'm going to stop share my screen and uh, hand it to talk to Chirong, who will be covering the aspect of uh, system uh, of distributed machine learning systems. All right, thank you, Eric. So we're now moving on to part two of the tutorial, uh, where we're going to have an in-depth look at the catalog of uh, different systems ML uh, components. Uh, and when we're doing this, it's, uh, you may think that, why do we have to go into detail and why do we have to look at each of these uh, pieces, what we call the aspects and the aspect instances in the notation we described earlier. Well, the payoff for this is that, as you'll see in the third part of this tutorial, we'll be able to construct systems that can systematically compose these different uh, pieces, thus enabling the reusability and higher level thinking that we described just now. And more importantly, it also opens up an opportunity to automatically compose systems that are tailored to a particular model. So that's a very interesting uh, research advancement that we're excited to talk about. But first we have to lay the basic foundations. So without further ado, let's start with the first aspect, which is computing, what's happening on each node. And in computing, we think about uh, two aspects, how parallel devices in an ML system encode the messages, which we denote M, and these messages, they correspond to the output of an update function, which we denote delta. We also think about how these messages are going to be aggregated together to compute an aggregation function that's called f in our notation. So one interesting thing is that even when different systems artifacts may share the same sequential ML algorithm, such as stochastic gradient descent, they will create and aggregate aggregate their messages differently. Uh, for example, a parameter server has a very, as the examples in Eric's section shown, a parameter server and an all reduced system uh, will create different messages and they will aggregate them quite differently. <clears throat> and understanding these differences is going to be the starting point for improving upon these systems artifacts or composing them together to form the complex compositional strategies which we gave examples for earlier. We also need to think about how we can balance the cost of computing and aggregating these messages across different devices. How can we make the messages smaller before we transmit them? And if we make these messages smaller through say compression and approximation, what are the drawbacks and how do we need, how can we mitigate some of these drawbacks? <clears throat> 
So as kind of an outline for this section, we're going to study several ways in which we can take those messages and shrink them down. The goal being to reduce the size and communications cost of messages because network bandwidth and communication bandwidth is limited in a distributed system and is often going to be a major bottleneck in uh, maintaining a high throughput of the system. Some of these ways to shrink messages include uh, sufficient factors, which are basically a low rank representation of matrix updates, uh, sparsification of gradients, such as a uh, dropout, dropout and thresholding, lossy compression, mixed position and quantization. And each of these schemes is interestingly relevant only to specific uh, systems artifacts. For example, sufficient factors are used in the SFB system, sufficient factor broadcast. Uh, Sparsifications of gradients is kind of uh, applicable to both parameter server and all reduce. And lossy compression of gradients is kind of a black box technique that works uh, generally across many systems artifacts. So these are some uh, interesting points to pay attention to that not every uh, encoding scheme is compatible with every artifact out there. <clears throat> Uh, to begin, let's recap a little bit of background about the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. It updates the parameters, which we denote uh, with capital A, using the full gradient calculation. Uh, SGD replaces the full gradient with a stochastic estimate, which is the red portion we've highlighted on the uh, third line equation. And the most basic form of SGD uh, just uses one randomly drawn sample, uh, X sub i, for the estimate. Uh, Typically, we don't use that form of SGD. We instead use mini batch SGD, which replaces the single sample with several samples, uh, typically tens up to thousands in most deep learning uh, applications. So now the stochastic estimate is just the update function uh, delta in our notation uh, and distributed SGD which is what we're going to be uh, using for many of the systems artifacts we talk about in this tutorial, you can think of it as a divide and conquer algorithm that distributes the samples in the stochastic estimate over P devices. So if we had a thousand samples in a mini batch, we're just going, and we had 10 devices, we're maybe going to give a hundred samples to each device. Each device simply computes the gradients on its samples and sums them into a message M sub P and the central device aggregates all the different M sub P messages. Let's say it's 10 machines. So it's 10 different M sub one to M sub 10, and then performs the SGD update F centrally. Now, the challenge is that for a lot of deep learning models, uh, the size of any message is going to be equal to the number of model parameters and uh, contemporary models such as transform models usually have that in the billions or more. Uh, if you think about what a billion is, that's basically gigabytes of values. Uh, and most computer networks can only transmit at say uh, one to 10 gigabit speeds. Maybe you'll get hundred to 200 if you're using a very high end cluster, but the point is it's not trivial to send gigabytes of data uh, frequently over a network, but those are the speeds we're talking about. So what can we do? Well, there are clever ways to construct the distributed SGD messages so they become smaller. Many ML models, including DL models, use parameters that are matrices. So let's call them MPMs, matrix parameterized models for short. If we look at single matrix parameter W, the stochastic gradient of W uh, with respect to a single sample in a mini batch is actually a rank one matrix, which means you can express it as an outer product of two vectors uh, U and V. We're going to call them sufficient factors. <clears throat> so instead of sending uh, delta W, which is the gradient of W, which has size, uh, let's say the, it's got J rows and K columns, then it's size J times K, you can just send the sufficient factors. Uh, one of them is size J and the other is size K, so it's J plus K to transmit them across. And then you reconstruct delta W at the destination device. Once you reconstruct that, you can just apply the aggregation function F following the usual distributed SGD algorithm. Now, we can also reduce the size of messages by making them sparser. And a very well-known and famous way to make it sparse is to change the distributed SGD algorithm to essentially drop different neurons. That's a well-known dropout algorithm. You randomly pick some neurons in each layer and you just delete the weights touching those neurons. And then uh, importantly, you have to pick a different set of neurons every data sample X uh, in order to make sure this is going to be unbiased on average. You know, dropout has basically some nice properties. Uh, when you drop, if you drop those weights, their gradients are going to be zero. So the messages M are sparse and cheap to transmit. 
but note that as the mini batch size increases, the sparsity of the message decreases because you're adding all these sparse vectors together. You add enough of them together, it's no longer going to be sparse. Uh, in, in particular, let's say you have about 100 samples that are uh, added together. If you just look at the formula here, the, number, the probability of an element being zero is one minus p to the power of c. Um, that's uh, basically very unlikely for it to be zero. Uh, so you need to be careful because while dropout it has a lot of good uh, statistical properties, it uh, may not be the best algorithm for transmitting and specifying parameters over a network if the mini batch size is large. So, so okay, uh, what other solutions do we have? Uh, and, and maybe we don't want to use the dropout modification to distributed SGD. Let's say I want to stick to plain vanilla distributed SGD and you know, decouple the algorithm from the uh, approximations used to transmit these messages across the network. So let's talk about deep gradient compression, uh, which is the idea is that the messages should only transmit the most significant values. Maybe you have a vector that's a thousand elements long, but maybe only 10 of them matter because they're large magnitude and the rest are one to two orders of magnitude smaller. So we can put a threshold tau on the message and send only those elements that are larger than the threshold as a sparse message, while at the same time uh, accumulating all the elements uh, smaller than tau locally, so you transmit it later to avoid uh, bias. Uh, another technique that can be used uh, to reduce the size of messages is to employ uh, methods that kind of reduce the number of bits needed to store a full uh, dense message. So typically in most deep learning uh, applications, you store the parameters as 32-bit floating point. Uh, in an idea called mixed precision, the computation of uh, during back propagation is performed in 16-bit floating point. Uh, and then the parameters are kind of still stored as 32-bit. So, so what happens is that when you convert the parameters from 32-bit to 16-bit, you need to use a extra uh, scalar value to track bigger and smaller values that, 13, that cannot be represented in 16-bit. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, how you know, IEEE 32-bit and 16-bit works, they essentially have a value that tracks the magnitude of the uh, number and 32-bit can track larger magnitude. So it's a, it's a thing you need to be a little careful about. Um, now, historically, the, uh, the mixed precision paper cited over here, uh, the goal wasn't to speed up distributed computation, but merely just to speed up local computation on a GPU because GPUs perform 16-bit computations uh, faster. They never really, uh, they never really did this in a distributed setting, so they didn't consider what happens if we store 6, 10, 16 bit or even smaller, like imagine 8 bit, 2 bit, 1 bit messages across the network. So that brings us to the next uh, 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 kind of uh, idea, which is quantization, um, which is kind of taking the idea behind mixed precision to its logical extreme. Uh, I apologize a little bit for the, the image uh, overlapping a bit of the text there. Uh, which I'll read out in a while, but instead of going down from 32 to 16 bit, why don't we reduce it all the way to what's called a trit, meaning ternary digit. It's a value that only takes uh, three values, uh, uh, minus one, zero, and one. And like mixed position, you have to use a scalar S to represent the big and small numbers, and multiple matrices of vectors will share one scalar. So uh, you can imagine that when you're storing values that only need to be represent three numbers and a lot of them share one scalar, you're going to have a very high compression ratio. Um, and uh, what this next sentence that's kind of obscured says is that ternary gradients and most quantization techniques are a special case of uh, an algorithm called Atomble, which is atomic sparsification. The, rest, uh, the reference is Wong et al. 2018. Um, so Atomble uh, is quite interesting. Given a gradient, and uh, what we call an atomic decomposition function. So examples of atomic decompositions are element-wise decomposition, uh, the famous SVD algorithm, singular value decomposition, or even Fourier de decompositions, and a sparsity budget. Uh, Atomo is able to basically reduce gradients into basis, basis, uh, basis elements that come from the atomic decomposition, and then construct a random unbiased sparsification that minimizes a variance. It also uh, is kind of a general theory that subsumes uh, turn grad as well as other methods such as uh, QSGD. All right, so 
that was the first part uh, about you know how to get uh, messages kind of smaller and more compressed. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, how different message aggregation schemes can reduce their cost. And you know this is kind of really interesting because now the different system artifacts uh, tend to be a one-to-one -one matching for different uh, aggregation schemes. Uh, for example, like parameter servers are almost always exclusively associated with a sharded model aggregation scheme. Uh, and, uh, you know, sufficient vector broadcast is associated with this uh, aggregation of sufficient vector scheme, which uh, we will we'll talk a little bit about. Okay. First, a little bit of back, let's open up a little bit of background. Uh, how, what is uh, the most trivial, simplest possible way to aggregate uh, different messages coming to a central machine? If each of the devices are computing an update delta, we can send them all to a central device and perform the SGD update, or even other algorithms uh, that have an appropriate aggregation function uh, F. Now, if the model has billions of parameters, uh, which is kind of the setting we're in these days, now then the delta is going to be just as large, gigabytes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, data centers, most data centers only have one to 10 gigabit network speed, and that's going to be even uh, smaller for any type of Internet of uh, Things application or edge computing or federated uh, AI applications. So with that amount of bandwidth, communications are going to bottle that to computing and production of uh, gradients. So how do we avoid this bottleneck? The answer is to perform the aggregation itself in parallel and not rely on a single machine. And there's two general approaches. One way is to shard the data. That's to say we split the data across different machines. And then this, what this does is that it reduces the, the maximum number of messages going to machine. So instead of, let's say there are 10 machines and one central machine, instead of having all 10 machines send 10 messages to the central machine, we might have two machines send uh, a message to one machine. And then we'll do this across many other machines. And then you can see there's a hierarchical scheme where uh, one machine is responsible for collecting messages from a small subset, and then eventually a central device collects all of them. So this reduces the number of messages and the uh, bottleneck or hotspot at a single machine, though uh, notice that it does not reduce the message size because we're still sending the full parameter message across. The other way is to use a sharded parameter scheme, and that um, is kind of the uh, opposite of sharded data you don't reduce the number of messages going to a machine. Uh, every one of the parallel uh, central machines has to receive all messages from all computing devices. But you do reduce the size of each machine because each uh, central machine is responsible for a different subset of parameters. And that's actually corresponding to the parameter server systems artifact. Uh, and then when a computing device needs the full parameters A, they will have to request the model shards from each and every of the central devices. Uh, now, as a little bit of an important uh, note, you may have heard the terms uh, data and model parallel, uh, if you've looked a little bit into uh, parallel computing for ML. Uh, I want to note that sharded data and sharded parameters are not the same concept as data or model parallel. Uh, here's an example to show you why. A parameter server is a data parallel update computing, but it's sharded parameters update aggregation. What this is saying is that the word sharded, it refers to the parallelization strategy of the aggregating central devices computing F and not the computing devices that compute uh, delta. That's the delta is what data and model parallel refer to and sharded it, uh, refers to basically uh, data shard or, par or parameter shard refers to this aggregation function F. Now let's look at another aggregation scheme. Uh, we talked about sufficient factors, which are these uh, matrix decomposition, where a large matrix is decomposed into two sufficient factors, the uh, low rank representation uh, vectors, U and V. So in this aggregation scheme, um, and for reasons that will become clear in the next slide, sufficient factors uh, have to be used with a fully connected peer-to-peer -to -peer topology. In this topology, every computing device will broadcast uh, for every sample of the mini batch, you get a sufficient factor pair u comma v. You'll have to broadcast this to every other device. There's no central servers. And so when a worker collects all sufficient factors from all other workers, 
it will reconstruct the matrices W and then update its local parameter copy uh, W. So why do we need to use a, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, decentralized architecture? Um, if you think about it, the sufficient factors U and V cannot be summed or aggregated together. They have to be sent as individual messages M. Uh, based, and unlike regular distributed SGD, which is where the gradients at a single machine can be uh, kind of summed and compacted into a single message, you just can't do this for SS because if you think about it, if you add all the U's and V's together and take the outer product, it is not equal to taking the outer product of each U and V and then summing the outer products together. So that's the reason why. And this leads to some of the interesting trade-offs that uh, you, you saw earlier when Eric introduced how different systems artifacts have kind of different weaknesses. So the weakness of sufficient, sufficient factors is that the cost of distributed uh, stochastic gradient descent on a parameter server architecture uh, using a matrix representation is basically O J times K. Uh, but the cost of transmitting sufficient uh, vectors and factors is O J plus K times C where C is the size of the mini batch because you have to send every sample uh, independently. So what this means is that there's, a, there's kind of a trade-off point where sufficient factors uh, are cheaper when the mini batch size is far smaller than J plus K. Uh, and this happens typically in fully connected feed forward uh, layers that tend to reside at the uh, top of a typical deep network. For example, if you are talking about a, a 1000 by 1000, uh, 1024 by 1024 matrix, right? That's over a million parameters. And you know most mini batch sizes are between 10 and 1000. So that's why it makes sense to use sufficient factors in that regime. You know, as a kind of a different paradigm, you can actually aggregate instead of gradients, you can aggregate model parameters. And this idea has been used in at least two places. Uh, in the most recent case, uh, it's been used in federated learning where you can't send data and gradients to the central device for various uh, privacy and security reasons. So what happens is that remote devices will update their local uh, model copy using single machine sequential stochastic gradient descent. And then they'll send a copy of the model itself to the central device. The central device will simply average the models together to obtain a new global model A before sending it back to the local devices. Uh, as an interesting historical note, uh, this idea of averaging models was proposed uh, far before the, uh, the current uh, federated AI uh, trend. Um, there was a paper in 2010 called Parallel SGD, which uh, essentially proposed the exact same technique, uh, but only using one global iteration. So this was actually one of the most uh, earliest distributed ML algorithms or systems artifacts that was, uh, uh, that was created. So now what, why would we choose to aggregate model parameters rather than, than gradients, right? It seems a little unusual. Uh, and indeed it does have some uh, drawbacks you need to pay attention to. Uh, well, aggregating and, aver and averaging model parameters is kind of simple to implement and uses, you know, much, much less network communication. Uh, instead of sending, you know, uh, one gradient for every data sample, you just send, you know, the entire model across after you've done many, many, many uh, epochs of SGD. So sounds too good to be true, right? Uh, and it's really great for privacy as well. But it is very prone to convergence failure. It is in many cases too good to be true because if different devices reach different local optima, uh, a little bit of common sense would tell you that the average of two optima is not an optimum. It's probably a trial or a peak. So that's something you have to be really careful. And uh, these averaging uh, aggregation or averaging of model parameter techniques will be very sensitive to initialization, uh, learning rates and, and batch sizes. Okay, so that brought us to the end of the computing uh, aspect. In summary, we looked at uh, these computing aspects and the aspect instances, uh, message encoding and update aggregation. And message encoding is really concerned with changing the composition of messages M, you know, especially to kind of shrink them down to a, to a more transmissible size. Whereas aggregation is tied to specific choices of the messages, as well as other aspects of ML systems. Now we move on to the second aspect, uh, communication, which is how do we, now that we constructed the messages and maybe shrunk them down, how are we gonna send them between different devices? And we're gonna talk about 
two things, network topologies, uh, which basically it's a, virtual, uh, it's a virtual graph that defines how messages M can travel the, between devices. It's not the same as the physical uh, network in the data center, but it's more like a virtual restriction on which machines should communicate with which other machines. And on top of that, we're gonna talk about how do we bridge the computation of the aggregation function F and the update function delta with the communication of messages M in order to ensure the uh, model is consistent. So the goals of bridging models are really to ensure that the model A, the parameters in the model A are consistent by restricting the order in which computation and communication operations can occur. But at the same time, we need to allow sufficient flexibility in this operations ordering because we need to be able to improve throughput under limited network bandwidth. You know, recall that if the models are you know, billions of parameters in size and therefore gigabytes and you only have one to 10 gigabit network, you're gonna to have to think about some clever ways to pipeline how the messages are sent and you know, advertise the cost of sending messages while computing is happening. And bridging models provide a way to do this, uh, but as we'll see, there's some very interesting trade-offs between throughput and statistical efficiency. So whereas computation was about how to reduce the size of messages uh, uh, M to reduce network costs, in communication, we want to reduce network costs in other ways without touching the contents of the messages themselves. Now, for example, we can maybe take, think about what if I delay the message? What if I just allow F and Delta to proceed with you know, the last iteration's messages instead of the current one? We can also apply different communication topologies to different parts of a complex deep learning model like we saw in the introduction. Uh, and the system can even adapt to available network bandwidth and change its strategy. So these are all the interesting space of optimizations that are possible in the communication aspect. Now, in terms of topologies, we're going to look at bipartite start topologies, peer-to-peer uh, -to -peer topologies, uh, an interesting topology that we call random multicast, as well as acyclic and cyclic uh, topologies. Now, like the computing and communication aspects, um, you can see that many of these topologies are closely associated with certain systems artifacts like PSM or Reduce. And, and that's kind of the reason why we study these aspects in this granular level, because if we look at just the systems artifacts like PS, SFB, and all Reduce, uh, sometimes it may seem impossible to decouple the different uh, design choices and architectural choices that are made. Our goal is to separate them out so they can be recombined and recomposed in uh, not only interesting, but very effective and uh, uh, complex ways. So let's begin the bipartite and star topology. It's used when, we com when computing devices are divided into two groups, uh, a server group and a worker group. Workers communicate deltas to servers and servers communicate uh, compute F the aggregation function and communicate the parameters A back to workers. Um, it should be noted that some uh, parameter server implementations will, uh, for, for kind of cost effectiveness, they'll place the server and worker programs on the same computing device. So in that case, the bipartite topology becomes virtual between the programs at the level of devices, the topology is actually uh, kind of fully connected. So, we talked about sufficient factors multiple times already. And you know, just again, to recap, they transmit vectors U and V instead of matrix gradients uh, denoted by Delta W. Uh, and this leads to a fully connected peer-to-peer -to -peer topology because the sufficient factors, you know, you cannot aggregate or sum them together. Otherwise you can't reconstruct the Delta W updates. And that forces this fully connected topology. However, what happens if we're willing to accept some uh, approximations? And that leads us to, uh, you know, in the computing aspect, we saw that dropout randomly drops parameters for each data sample used in SGD. And we can do a similar thing in sufficient factor approximation, where when you broadcast, instead of broadcasting to all devices, what if we only send to a randomly chosen a subset, a, a random multicast, and we call this a random multicast topology. And this reduces the number of messages per iteration from P squared to P times Q, where Q is the number of destination devices. So you can see that it's kind of like dropping entire samples. Uh, some machines will just not get that information. Um, so of course this comes at a cost. Uh, you reduce the network uh, bandwidth cost by a lot, uh, but will this converge? 
uh, it turns out that yes, it will have uh, lower statistical efficiency and you have to scale the learning rate uh, with a factor of one over uh, P minus Q. But the advantage is that you will avoid the network bottlenecks that happen when P gets large, allowing the uh, sufficient factor broadcast uh, systems artifact to function on larger clusters. Uh, ultimately, throughput and overall time to convergence is improved because the improvement in throughput uh, kind of outweighs the lower ring and statistical efficiency. Okay. Now, before we talk about the final set of topologies, acyclic and cyclic, uh, let's review some background about uh, uh, all reduce which is a recently popular systems artifact that's been used a lot in distributed training of deep learning uh, models. Like parameter server and sufficient factor broadcast, you know, every device in all reduce will compute the delta updates. But the big difference is that all reduce requires multiple communication rounds to perform aggregation across a ring or other type of uh, uh, lengthy uh, topology with multiple stages. Uh, this is unlike parameter server and sufficient factor broadcast, which conduct the aggregation in a single round. So in this example to the right at uh, round one, which is at the top, device P1 will aggregate uh, delta from P1 and 2, and device P3 aggregates P3 and P4. Then on round two, device P1 will aggregate from uh, P1 and P3 to compute F. Finally, the parameters are broadcast back to all devices uh, just by reversing, following the reverse of the aggregation direction. Okay. So because all reduce requires multiple communication rounds for aggregation, uh, it is going to be restricted to those topologies that have this uh, uh, nature that they can be partitioned into several rounds. So one example are the acyclic topologies, which includes trees and the star topology. Another example are cyclic or ring topologies, uh, including a, a round, so-called round robin topology. Uh, and these are topologies that change the edges uh, every round. So for example, if you look at uh, this, uh, simplest tree topology. You start with a two disjoint trees and then another disjoint tree in the next round. Okay. So recall earlier that we talked about uh, more complex distributed ML strategies that take advantage of multiple systems artifact to uh, you know do better than just applying a single like parameter server or all reduce to the entire deep network and. This is a good idea in general because most deep networks are heterogeneous and different parts perform better with different uh, network topologies attached to them. Uh, CNN models, convolutional neural networks are comprised of convolution and pooling layers with highly shared parameters. So the number of unique or distinct parameters is actually quite small in the lower layers. And they also have fully connected or feed forward layers with matrix parameters containing hundreds of millions of parameters or more. So, if we think about this strategy where we use a bipartite topology and parameter server for the lower convolution layers and the fully connected sufficient uh, topology with the sufficient factor broadcast for the feed forward layers, then this complex strategy is basically guaranteed to outperform only using a PS for the entire network or only using SVFB for the entire network. Because what's happening is that the sufficient factor broadcast will have higher throughput on the massive matrix shape parameters and fully connected layer. Even if your mini batch size is a thousand, that's small in comparison to the millions of parameters or more that are found in these layers. Uh, whereas the parameter server will, will enjoy a much higher throughput on the smaller, much smaller matrices in the convolution and pooling layers because they are able to aggregate messages. Remember that SFB can't aggregate the sufficient factors, whereas parameter server can aggregate many gradients from many uh, different mini batch samples into one message. So basically it's playing to the uh, advantages of each of the different uh, systems artifacts. And PS is better at shrinking messages for convolution layers. SFB is better at shrinking messages for feed forward layers. And another example which we saw earlier, in, nat in natural language processing models, it's pretty common to have an embedding layer followed by a more complex language model, for example, made up of different transformer layers. Uh, empirically, it can be shown that parameter servers will perform better on the embedding layers, which are highly sparse, whereas all reduced performs better on the uh, core language model itself. And the point that we're trying to get here is that by studying all of these uh, aspects, aspects, instances, and decomposing them, and then recomposing them into these uh, complex strategies, uh, we open up new opportunities to 
if not not just accelerate the convergence of uh, ML models uh, according to uh, the wall of time, but it's really also that if we note that these complex strategies are kind of very difficult for a human to implement, right? It's already hard enough for someone to implement and make use of a parameter server of all reduced. Now you're going to have to put several of them in one model. So this may be a challenge, but it's also an opportunity to create systems that make it easy to specify or even automatically generate such strategies, which we'll talk more about in the third section of this tutorial. So uh, lastly, um, we'd like to talk about uh, bridging and consistency models, which control the order of computation and communication operations in distributed ML systems. And the goal here is to increase throughput without hurting the statistical efficiency too much. And there's kind of three models of consistency, uh, strict, bounded, and asynchronous. Um, their impact on uh, many facets of ML training is actually pretty far reaching. And we're gonna talk about that in detail. So let's start with a strict consistency. Uh, uh, the baseline here is a bridging model that's called bulk synchronous parallel, BSP for short. Uh, BSP requires devices to strictly alternate between a computation phase, then a communication phase called a global barrier, and then back to computation and communication again. Uh, the global barrier or communication phase is basically the boundary between different distributed SGD uh, iterations. Uh, BSP has all the good properties that you'd expect from running a, a you know, like SGD on a single machine. Execution is going to be serializable uh, under you know, some fairly common assumptions, like the aggregation F is agnostic to the order in which the, de the Delta messages arrive. That's true for distributed SGD because it doesn't matter whether you add the first sample to the 10th sample, uh, whatever order you add the samples in, it doesn't matter for the final aggregation. Okay. So when you're in a highly controlled uh, network environment with uh, very high grade networking hardware, for example, high performance computing uh, clusters or, or supercomputing centers uh, for the research of AI, uh, BSP performs very well in these environments and it's very commonly used in them. Uh, but what you need to know is that in a cloud corporate data center or mid-range computing environments, first of all, network bandwidth is much smaller than in HPC environments. It's also shared among many users. And the hardware is probably not state-of-the-art. Uh, it doesn't probably doesn't come with state-of-the-art cooling, vibration, and environmental control systems, uh, which can create interesting uh, variations in performance between machines that are situated at different parts of different uh, physical locations in the data center. So when you combine these factors, limited network bandwidth, uh, multiple users that are competing for the network bandwidth and these environmental conditions, you get a problem called stragglers, which are devices that are transiently or temporarily slower than the others. And under BSP, one slow device is going to force all other devices to wait. The more devices you have, the higher chance you have a straggler, and all it takes is one straggler to greatly hurt the throughput of BSP. So that leads us to bounded consistency, which is a middle ground between BSP and uh, fully asynchronous, or also known as hog wild uh, ex execution. Uh, and for example, one of the bounded consistency models, which, uh, which uh, is something I've taken personal research in, is still synchronous parallel, uh, SSP. Under SSP, workers mostly run at their own pace. They're allowed to run basically faster or slower. And the fastest and slowest, the condition here, there's just one condition. The fastest and slowest workers must not drift by more than S iterations, which we also call clocks. So here the example is that they can't drift more than uh, three iterations apart. S is known as the maximum stillness. And in this example, you know, device four is at iteration four and is about to prevent enter iteration five but gets blocked because device A is at clock number one. And then, you know, basically five minus one is four and that's higher than maximum stillness three. Okay. So SSP has several uh, variations. The original SSP model espouses uh, so-called lazy communication. And under lazy communication, the updates delta are not communicated unless the maximum stillness will be violated. That is to say, the system tries to send a message as late as possible in order to save bandwidth, prioritize saving network bandwidth, which is to always favor throughput, even at the expense of the statistical efficiency loss that occurs when you delay messages by too much. So for example, here in this example, device C 
its uh, iteration three update doesn't actually have to be sent to the B, device B until device B reaches uh, clock number five, iteration five. Uh, but on the other hand, device C's uh, first two messages from iteration one and two, they will have to be communicated to device uh, B by the time it reaches iteration four. Otherwise that will violate the maximum stillness, which is two of this example. At the other extreme uh, is a variation of SSP known as uh, eager SSP, and that's essentially the opposite of the lazy communication strategy. In eager SSP, the implementation monitors the available network bandwidth, and whenever bandwidth is available, it's going to send updates opportunistically, whenever possible. If there's no bandwidth available, then behavior reverts to SSP lazy communication, which is to not send anything until you're forced to uh, by the stillness threshold. So that, that was kind of the SSP family of bounded uh, asynchronous uh, models, you know, ranging from a lazy version that waits until the last minute to send messages and an eager version that always tries to send messages as long as the network has bandwidth. And finally, we come to uh, asynchronous communication, which is all the way at the far extreme, uh, opposite extreme from bound synchronous parallel. If BSP is the strictest form of consistency, then asynchronous is probably the least strict form. It has no communication barriers. Devices won't ever wait for each other. So the time spent computing is maximized, but transient stragglers will cause messages to be extremely stale under asynchronous. And we'll have to see uh, what those consequences are on the next slide. It should be noted that some of these implementations may even allow messages to be applied while device computing uh, F or Delta, like partially applying a gradient to a device's parameters A while that device is trying to compute Delta at the same time. So this kind of happened in the early years of uh, research to async communication where people were not very careful about uh, atomic updates and other kind of uh, non-deterministic consequences. Uh, needless to say, such implementations will lead to very unpredictable behavior and most likely loss of statistical efficiency. So what's the cost of asynchrony and, and kind of old messages? What happens when these messages get too stale and too old? So the training algorithm will most likely fail to converge. Uh, if, you know, under say SSP, you let the maximum staleness S be too high, then divergence will occur due to lazy communication because it's waiting until the last uh, second to send messages. The actual staleness, staleness will always be close to the maximum staleness S. Now, eager SSP, it won't diverge uh, thanks to eager communication. As long as there's bandwidth, the average staleness will be kept low. Now, asynchronous uh, systems don't have any control over staleness or delayed messages. So there's kind of a risk of a divergence, especially once the network starts to get bottlenecked. That's not to say that uh, theoretically asynchronous cannot converge. It can converge under some strong, but uh, what I consider to not always be realistic assumptions. Uh, assumptions like parallel computing on data samples, uh, where the non-zero gradient updates don't touch the same parameters. So that was a bit of a, a complex statement to unpack. But basically, it's saying that if I have a sparse model and the updates touch different parts of the sparse model, then asynchronous is safe. Uh, but that requires your model to be sparse. Another assumption is that the delays are kind of upper bounded in practice, but that's never a good assumption for large distributed systems because of the transient straggler uh, effect. And as we'll see soon, deep learning is fairly intolerant of even uh, medium sized delays. So up until now, we've been talking about uh, several metrics of goodness, throughput and statistical efficiency, uh, also known as empirical convergence rate. Throughput is the rate at which the distributed system processes data samples, uh, iterations of epoch per unit time. It's pretty easy to measure. Many systems and our papers focus on this metric. Then there's statistical efficiency, which is the empirical progress per iteration step or, or batch of data towards a local optimum. Uh, I say empirical because it's often quite different in practice from theoretical upper bounds. It's hard to directly measure statistical efficiency uh, but we can, we will actually discuss how we can model this uh, using data collected from the running system later in this tutorial. Finally, we have good put, which we introduced earlier as throughput times statistical efficiency. It's the empirical progress per unit time towards a local optimum. And we'll talk about this, uh, you know, in depth in the second half of the tutorial. If we think about what's the impact of staleness, staleness increases throughput while decreasing statistical efficiency. So throughput is the bottleneck, which is usually the case in distributed ML training. 
Then applying the bounded consistent asynchronous model like SSP or eager SSP will improve throughput. And these uh, SSP style models do have good theoretical guarantees under fairly realistic assumptions. Although uh, as we noted for la the lazy version, you shouldn't set the maximum stillness as to be too large. Uh, whereas asynchronous has theoretical guarantees. I don't personally think the assumptions are always realistic uh, and empirically can be quite unreliable in clusters that are not uh, like high grade uh, isolated uh, HPC style clusters. I want to say a few words about a uh, theoretical convergence rate. Well, this is not going to be a focus, theory is not going to be a focus of this tutorial, but it's important to know that uh, one can derive three types of bounds for SSP and its family, an expectation bound, a probability bound, and a variance bound. And in particular, uh, ESSP convergence does behave uh, like sequential single machine execution up to a factor that depends on staleness and the number of machines. So you don't need to stare too deeply at this equation, but what you need to know is that in these, uh, in these uh, convergence bounds for ESSP, it connects the model characteristics, the Lipschitz constant L and several other uh, model specific constants like F with different systems parameters, S the maximum stillness and P the number of parallel uh, machines. Briefly, the bound shows one over square root T convergence, which is modified by F, L, S and P. And then in this probability bound, uh, so this probability bound basically says that parameters, uh, the probability that the parameters are greater than a modest threshold tau will decrease exponentially, exponentially that's to say one over exp uh, t. And again, the familiar constants L, S and P uh, will modify the rate. Uh, but here we also kind of upgrade the theory by introducing the concept of the average stillness and the variance of the stillness. Uh, and these are different from the maximum stillness. So like average and variance is different from maximum, right? And so what we're doing is that we're looking at the dis probability distribution over different stillness values, the level of asynchrony between different machines. Lazy SSP will show the mean very close to the maximum S because that's exactly what it's programmed to do. And eager SSP will try to keep the mean of stillness as close to zero as that bandwidth allows. And finally, uh, the ESSP variance bound uh, here, it's basically saying that the uncertainty in the parameter estimates monotonically decreases when close to a low flow optimum. So, and then the idea is that low variance in the estimates leads to higher stability of parameter estimates. So that's more confidence in the route result and more confidence that when you trigger a stopping criterion, like let's say the gradient isn't changing that much or the log, uh, the objective function isn't changing that much, you can be pretty confident that it's actually converged. Lower average stillness improves convergence speed and parameter quality. Uh, that's basically the takeaway. Okay. All right. So what, let's look at some empirical uh, uh, results to back up that theory. If we look at simple feed forward neural networks trained on a small data set like uh, MNIST between say zero to six hidden layers, we'll see that deeper models will experience greater statistical efficiency penalties. Uh, basically how many batches of data they need to converge. And, but, on the other hand, increasing stillness will greatly increase throughput, uh, usually by 100% or more. Since the uh, statistical efficiency penalty is maybe 30% and the throughput increases 100%, and good put is stat efficiency times throughput, therefore good put increases. Uh, but as the models get more complex, let's look at variational autoencoders with one to three hidden layers. Once we get up to three hidden layers and pretty high stillness, like stillness 16 iterations, uh, we start to see statistical efficiency penalties in excess of 100%. Uh, so taking more than 100% iterations means that you're basically taking twice as many batches to converge or more. So in general, complex networks happen to be more sensitive to staleness and uh, care should be taken not to set too high staleness or asynchrony uh, values in such networks. So that was how staleness affects different model architectures, but what about different training algorithms? So when we substitute the Adam uh, optimization algorithm instead of distributed SGD, uh, knowing that Adam is a higher order algorithm that requires the first and second moments of stochastic gradients. And then if we apply staleness in a naive fashion to Adam, then what happens is the first and second moments uh, become, the estimates become very unreliable and that causes a, a, a pretty huge statistical efficiency penalty as shown in the graph. 
Um, the note remark here is that uh, more research needs to be done on how to apply bound up consistency with these higher order algorithms such as Adam, especially how to enforce, say, lower staleness values when estimating uh, higher order moments. Um, you know, as a remark, although Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms are not as popular these days, it should be noted that staleness does uh, work for them. Uh, and MCMC algorithms, kind of like uh, you know SGD algorithms, they 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 work very well with low staleness, uh, but uh, they do diverge at higher values of staleness. Uh, so again, the message is: do not set staleness too high. It's important, and and this is kind of also the reason why I, I personally don't advocate the use of asynchronous, uh, fully asynchronous algorithms in large distributed settings for machine learning. Uh, as another note, bounded consistency has other applications such as the ability to recover from faults. So you don't actually have to restore all parameters from a checkpoint. You can only restore the devices that crash and let the non-fault devices proceed with their existing uh, uh, you know, uh, progress instead of resetting it to the last checkpoint. Uh, this, this basically can be proven to be correctly converged under a theory that's pretty similar to the SSP theory. And basically you get better throughput and statistical efficiency. So in summary for communication, we looked at the uh, network topologies and consistency models. Topologies are graphs that define which devices can send messages to each other. And consistency models are basically saying, let's trade some statistical efficiency for much higher throughput and then get overall increased good put, which is throughput times stat efficiency. So it's, uh, it's been about 105 minutes into the tutorial. Um, I imagine people need a little bit of a break. So we're going to take five minutes uh, and then reconvene at, uh, let's say, uh, 4.50 p.m. Eastern time or 1.50 p.m. Uh, Pacific time.
<laughs> okay. Um, it is now uh, four fifty p.m. Eastern, so uh, I'm going to continue on with the tutorial. Okay. All right. So the third and final uh, aspect, memory management, uh, concerns essentially uh, where do we put the data and model on different devices or different storage subsystems within uh, different computing devices. Uh, we have partition and placement, which is about how to divide or replicate model parameters A, as well as the intermediate states and data across different devices. Uh, now, noting that models can be very large and may not fit in the memory of a single GPU device, uh, how can we proactively load, remove, and cache the parameters A and intermediate states between memory systems? That's storage hierarchy management. And finally, how do we pipeline computation of updates and aggregations with different uh, memory operations, which are expressed as messages M? Uh, noting that this is at a finer granularity than the bridging models. Bridging models, which we talked about earlier, they're kind of concerned with a cost grain ordering of computation versus network operations. So here we're concerned about the finer grain ordering of very uh, individual like calculations in a deep learning back propagation algorithm uh, versus the memory operations to store and load uh, different parameters in and out of GPU memory. So we want to focus on optimizing computation and memory accesses within each device here. This is grounded in the context of how these operations uh, have an interplay with the distributed or network communication. Noting that GPU memory can't fit larger models uh, fully, you have to plan the memory transfers ahead of time, or you have to employ some uh, creative solutions like spending extra computation to reduce the memory transfers. Ultimately, the goal is to improve throughput without affecting or hurting statistical efficiency. So most memory management uh, uh, systems try not to hurt statistical efficiency where possible. Okay, so there are many ways to partition, duplicate, and place parameters and data samples across different devices. We're going to talk a little bit about parameter servers, uh, independent partitioning methods, using ML-based models to do partitioning, such as reinforcement learning, as well as how do we partition computing operators, uh, inputs and outputs. Uh, some schemes include SOAP and partition and reduce. So first, uh, as background, let's introduce a concept called DSM or distributed shared memory. It's a simple concept that essentially can think of it as a piece of software that makes the parameters accessible from any device via data structure APIs that look a lot like vector or matrix accesses. Under the hood, the DSM system will manage the partition and placement across devices and storages in a way that the user doesn't see. A parameter server is basically an example of a DSM and DSMs can be conjoined with bridging and consistency models. Users can easily switch between BSP or asynchronous or even an SSP with just a few lines of code. So to recap parameter servers, computing devices have workers holding partition data and servers that hold partition model parameters. Workers send delta updates to servers and servers send parameters back to workers. Uh, in some parameter server designs, the parameters will be duplicated over the servers uh, so it's a combination of partitioning and duplication in order to provide fault tolerant redundancy in case a single parameter server uh, uh, crashes. Um, an interesting opportunity arises if the training algorithm is model parallel, such as quoted descent algorithms, uh, and the model parameters are also matrix structured, then you can partition the parameters in a way that doesn't need computation. Uh, the general idea is to divide the matrix parameters into K by K, uh, sub matrices. Uh, here it's three by three, and then group the sub matrices into three um, disjoint sets. Uh, for example, um, here uh, set uh, one one two two three three is disjoint from this one, which is uh, one three. Um, right. Uh, sorry, row three one uh, one two and two three. The idea is that you can run a model parallel algorithm on one of these sets at a time. And thanks to the independence property, the devices don't need to communicate until the end of the set. Uh, then a more kind of sophisticated um, extension of this is to apply uh, ML models such as reinforcement learning to automatically partition the model parameters and intermediate variables. 
some experiments have shown that this can yield up to 28% better uh, good put or time to convergence on RNN and CNN networks. Uh, and this is kind of, a, kind of a prelude to automatic compositionality across multiple systems aspects, uh, not just the model, how to partition the model, but how to select different topologies, messaging schemes, and update schemes. And that can actually produce up to 60% faster time to convergence, which we'll show a little bit later. Another way to handle the partitioning and placement is to focus on operators rather than data and parameters. Uh, so what are operators? They're the elementary functions that make up an ML or D, uh, deep learning model. Uh, you know, uh, ReLU units, convolution operations, matrix vector multiplications, these are all operators uh, that are found uh, uh, when you actually look deep into, for example, the loss function of a neural network. And operator-centric partitioning, uh, such as the SOAP scheme, uh, instead of thinking of partitioning of data and model, it first looks at an output's operator, uh, an operator's output tensors, right? So basically, if I'm going to do like a times x, then what's the output? It's going to it's going to basically be you know another uh, a matrix or vector, and then we're going to assign different devices to different blocks of the output, right? Let's say it's an output matrix. I might assign GPU one to the top left block and GPU three to the bottom left block, and then based on what the uh, what devices are assigned to compute which block the devices are going to pull in the different pieces of data and parameter necessary to compute that block and that drives the partitioning and duplication as needed for this uh, assignment uh, another scheme is partition and reduce where instead of uh, soap where devices compute disjoint parts of the op the output matrix uh, here so uh, partition and reduce also supports the uh, computation of overlapping blocks that can be combined via addition other reduction operations. So uh, for example, in, in this diagram B, instead of computing, say, the top half and bottom half of different GPUs, both GPUs will compute the full matrix, but only part of the values needed and then add them later. So storage hierarchy management uh, is concerned with how to place the data, parameters, and intermediate values on different memory and storage subsystems. Again, because GPU memory is just too small to hold large models with billions of parameters, you know, gigabytes of values. So to understand why, uh, uh, how a typical device uh, memory is structured across CPU and GPU, uh, know that GPUs, which tend to perform the bulk of ML computations these days, uh, will be able to quickly access their attached GPU memory. And they can also access CPU memory but it does it very slowly. On the other hand, GPU memory is kind of small. Uh, most typical GPUs would have eight to 16 gigabytes of memory, uh, server grade or high performance computing grade GPUs might have 40 to 48 gigabytes these days. Uh, but what, what matters is that if you have a massive parameter model, which is over 10 billion or even 100 billion parameters, forget even fitting it on a GPU. You can't even fit it on a CPU with 256 gigabytes of memory. And so you're gonna to have to partition the model across devices when faced with such massive models. So now, and, and the fact that you can only fit part of the model inside CPU or GPU memory means that at some point, you're going to have to swap out the model or its intermediate values between different storage subsystems because if you don't do that, then you can't update it. And Swapping is just really slow and it's going to hurt throughput by causing computation to wait for all the memory swapping to occur. And then we're gonna talk about how we're gonna address this challenge. So first, a little bit of background. How do most deep learning systems like TensorFlow or PyTorch actually manage the GPU's memory? By default, they're gonna to try to fit all parameters and intermediate values onto the GPU. So if the model's too large, they're not even gonna run. They're just going to crash outright. And that's where you need third-party software or additional tools to be needed to manage the memory. Um, as a side note, uh, common sense will, will tell you that the trading data will be too large to fit on any GPU memory. And it's always sorted to GPU memory one stochastic rate of descent mini batch at a time. So what are, in summary, what are the challenges in memory management for deep learning training? You've got huge models that are hundreds of millions to hundreds of billions of parameters. Interestingly, this might not be obvious, but it's an important fact. The intermediate values, they, th this is basically the number of parameters times the size of your mini batch. These can, because your mini batches are at least 10 or more, 
they're going to be at least 10 times the size of the model or bigger. And even a, a modest, like by today's standards, 100 million parameter model will barely fit on a 16 gigabyte GPU. And recent 40 gigabyte GPUs will only fit about 400 million parameter models. You'll never be able to fit a, a 1 billion parameter model onto any GPU. So you have to develop better strategies and software tools. Okay. So one, one way to, to alleviate this problem is to do paging, uh, otherwise known as memory swapping. Um, Memory swapping systems are a simple idea. When you do back propagation, you only touch two layers at a time. So what if we just load the, the parameters and intermediate values that are connected to these layers? And then as the algorithm is about to move to the next layer, we unload the previous layer and load in the new layer. Okay. Now, this is, uh, although this wall is a good solution to the memory challenge, it should be you know, reminded that CPU and GPU memory transfers are expensive. So the, the, the system will have to schedule these memory swaps in the background to properly amortize the cost. They have to do it well in advance of when the values be needed. They can't, you, you can't just do it when you need it. So you can do a controller algorithm that runs a virtual iteration to record a so-called trace of the GPU memory access order. And then this, for most models, this will be always stay the same for every data sample in the mini batch. Uh, usually there's no randomization in the, uh, in the algorithm. And then when the GPU is done computing these active layers, just swap out the previous layers to CPU memory, swap in the next layers to the GPU memory. Uh, the upshot of paging is that you can run models that are about three times larger, although you do take a hit about 27% throughput. Uh, but uh, being able to run a bigger model opposed to not being able to run it, uh, you know, I'll take being able to run it, for instance. And you can even get this idea more fine grained If the model is so large that even a single layer won't fit into memory, well, just break the layer up into its different, uh, uh, different tensors and operators and just swap them in and out. And if you do this level of really fine grain swapping, you can get even further. Instead of three times larger models, you can get all the way to eight times larger. So that's like being able to run a one billion parameter uh, model on just a 16 gigabyte GPU. Now, memory swapping, uh, although it's only concerned with memory operations, these live in the context of uh, other operations that are happening in the back propagation system. The allocation and deallocation of memory, the order and timing of the different uh, computing operators, right? And in addition to when to swap memory. So you can go further and jointly optimize all these, the, the scheduling of these three types of uh, operations. And that can actually make memory swapping even easier or more effective under this joint optimization scheme. Right. Now, a different solution under the memory swapping is something we call uh, rematerialization, uh, which is the idea that instead of storing all of the intermediate values, we should just recompute it from, say, a nearby checkpoint. Uh, checkpoint is the wrong word here. It's more like there's a nearby node in the computational back propagation graph, and we're going to recompute it from there. Because if we can just recompute it on demand, then we don't have to use memory to store the intermediate values. Okay. So that leads to an optimization problem. Where do we place the uh, rematerialization uh, uh, checkpoint or, or basically uh, save points, right? And then this, uh, I won't go into the details too much, but essentially this is an optimization problem that considers what nodes to checkpoint, when do you create and remove the checkpoints, and how to schedule the rematerialization operations in a way that you don't exceed your memory budget while still being as fast as possible. Right. The final topic for this uh, section is read and write scheduling, which is about uh, also known as pipelining. And this is about reordering the different operations, uh, the low level of fine rate operations in the back propagation system in order to improve the throughput of the overall uh, distributed system. So what exactly is pipelining? Um, note that model updates can take much longer than computations because they need to be transmitted as messages M to say commit to GPU memory or even to send it across the network. And so you have to account for the transfer capacity, which is essentially the, the memory speed and the network speed of the DSM system. And you wanna actually take advantage of these periods of idleness to send stuff while the opportunity exists. So while most pipelining schemes will try to maintain serializability and not hurt statistical efficiency, 
there's a few schemes out there that might try to sacrifice a little bit of this for higher throughput. Okay. So ML training algorithms such as SGD, uh, to recap, they can coalesce updates by adding them together, right? Since all the gradients are additive, can be added together before aggregation, you know, you can reduce the number of messages greatly this way. So that leads to two interesting scenarios. You can call less messages to reduce the transfer cost, but then you risk computation stall, waiting for the computation to occur. That's, that's the upper example. Or you can send messages ASAP without coalescing, but then you will kind of end up using the entire network capacity. If you're not careful, you'll actually overload and create a bottleneck. So the point is that there you have to be uh, I think uh, the word I'd use is you have to be conscientious about how much network bandwidth is available so that you don't lower throughput by creating too many messages. And you have to be also careful about how much you delay messages so that computing doesn't have to wait for that. It's a balance of timeliness versus the number of messages versus the transfer capacity of the network. So we can also go a little further and prioritize the different updates based on their magnitude. So recall earlier, we talked about different uh, compression schemes, right? Where one of the schemes was, we'll send the largest values of a update, a gradient vector across the network and send smaller values later. So you can do that. That's basically this idea here. You prioritize the messages uh, M with larger you know, magnitude, like larger L2 norm, uh, and just delay the smaller updates until capacity is available. Um, so the disadvantage here is that if transfer capacity gets saturated, as can happen in a network that's shared, then the small updates can be delayed for an indefinite amount of time and that breaks serializability. Uh, but the, the damage isn't too much because the delayed updates are small. So the decrease in statistical efficiency by losing small updates is actually provably small. And in general, you get a throughput increase that outweighs the statistical, statistical efficiency loss, therefore good put improves. Uh, and, and essentially the upshot is that you can get kind of about 35% better good put uh, versus even other highly optimized baselines. Okay. Other forms of pipelining include weight-free back propagation. Uh, the idea is that during the backwards pass, uh, you don't wait until the last layer to send all the messages. As each layer, you go down from say layer three to layer two in the backwards pass, you can send the message from layer three out uh, in advance. And by doing this, you reduce the amount of uh, uh, waiting time uh, between the next backward pass and the next forward pass. Okay. Um, you can even go further to prioritize updates based on destination. Like if the different layers are uh, you know, partitioned across different machines, you can in fact uh, send messages that would be needed by the machines that are on the earlier layers of the forward pass. Uh, in doing so, you probably end up creating uh, more messages but the whole point is to make sure that uh, use the network bandwidth as effectively as possible uh, so that no, no computing uh, device is waiting. And if that means sending more messages while well, we you have the bandwidth for that, that's all the more power to the system. So in summary, memory management, you know, looks at the aspects of partition and placement, storage hierarchy and read write scheduling. Everything here tries to improve throughput. Some of them try to sacrifice a bit of statistical efficiency all of them work by creating and reordering computations, memory read writes and network messages, usually by solving a joint optimization problem. And that brings us to the end of the distributed ML aspects, computing, communication, and memory management. And I'd like to turn uh, you know, the session over to how to go into the next part, composition of systems. Thanks, Chiro. Yep. So I will take over from this point. Yep. Uh, so, uh, I will be talking about the composition of systems. So where Eric has systematically defined what a distributed ML strategy is, and Chirong has went through various existing techniques and um, papers and tried to interpret them in a way that it corresponds them into their belonging parallel ML aspects. So in this part of the tutorial, I will show that following this new view and the development, we are able to develop new techniques uh, to significantly improve the usability of distributed ML and make it much more accessible to normal users. Yeah. So to start, let's first look at what are the current common practices in developing and using distributed ML training systems. So in fact, a normal observation you might have experienced is that you might find that there are many, many distributed ML systems and each system might be designed for a specific set of model. Uh, as I showed in this slide. 
So this usually has very negative results. Um, so first, machine learning is diverse with highly variable architecture. Um, when a new architecture emerges, we need to design another system or strategy to scale that model. Second, um, this practice usually results in separate code bases and system implementations. So a direct consequence of distinct, distinct implementations of various programming interface they offered to the users. Examples include writing partitioning layout called mesh when you are trying to use a framework called mesh TensorFlow to do model parallelism, or when using or reduce for data parallel, data parallel ML programs, um, one has to learn how to patch optimizers um, or how to manually average gradients if you use the PyTorch DPP library. And all these are famous system artifacts um, that have, have been adopted elsewhere. Um, we believe that this adds like trivial overhead to the model prototyping when users who are not familiar with um, distributed systems try to approach distributed ML. So let's take a recap again on our dis dis distributed ML training strategy aspects. So we have identified the basic building block aspects that compose a distributed ML strategy, uh, like Chiron has covered, covering computing, memory management, and communication, et cetera. And a key note here is that um, while practical system implementations might exhibit in different forms or different code bases, we can always extract the distributed strategies they use and write them in a composable form, such as uh, for this primary server example. I think Eric has gone through an example, but I'm going to uh, take another visualization for you to fully understand this. So uh, we, we can visualize a breakdown of the strategy uh, in terms of each aspect in the slide. For example, for this primary server example, um, so basically the model parameters are held on distributed shared memory, which is called DSM, and sharded on each device. And the data is, data is partitioned and distributed across nodes. And the gradient updates that are generated on each device are communicated following, following a start topology. And that primary server strategy normally adopts a BSP consistent model to bridge parallel computation between devices. So following this flow, um, to, you know, we, we, we are actually able to compose, say, reconstruct that primary server strategy by choosing an instant choice from each of these phases I marked on, on the bottom of the slide. Yeah. So this actually offers a new opportunity. Um, we might take a fundamentally different approach to build distributed ML systems. Say, um, if we are able to build a unified representation to express each parallel ML aspect and also a composable backend system to allow for assembling these aspects, then we can use these basic building blocks to derive new algorithms and systems, just like we are building Lego, so to allow this composition of parallel ML strategies. And a, a very distinct advantage is that we can actually customize the strategies that are depending on what model or what cluster we try to scale our machine learning program on. So in other words, this would greatly reduce the complexity when user tries to seek for purple distributed machine learning system from um, you know, a world of systems on the open source, um, given their you know, model and cluster at hand. OK, um, so to illustrate uh, this, to illustrate this idea, instead of um, like building monolithic and bespoke systems, we might build a more reconfigurable, repurposable, and a generalizable system, just like Lego. And by just building, by, by first building pre-made, standardized, and reusable parts, and then we assemble these parts to construct those com complete strategies for our model of interest and cluster of interest. Um, but the question to ask here is, uh, what it might take to achieve there? Um, Actually, we can easily make a connection between this ambition um, with the current programming language compiler. Uh, what we need might be like a representation library of aspect instances that Chiron has covered. Um, we also might need language for creating strategies out of this uh, aspect instances. Um, and in programming language, we know there's some sort of intermediate representation of the model or computation that is instructed in the user program. We might need something similar for, for distributed ML strategy. And, um, and together, we also need some software implementation and tools associated with the above. Yeah. So to see how this might work, let's break the distribution of ML programs into phases, uh, just like I did for that primary server. Um, uh, but following our new definition of um, this atomic parallel ML aspects. So on the left hand, we have the original ML program, which might be, for example, um, a data flow graph representation in TensorFlow. Um, on the x-axis below, 
we categorize different distributed machine learning aspects into this orthogonal categories covering computing, memory management, and communication. So each category maps to a phase where we convert the original ML program, say data flow graph, uh, in its current state into the next state. So in most cases, these phases are independent, like Chiron has covered. Um, by going through these phases, we can obtain a complete and correct distributed program runnable on target cluster, um, which we noted here as a system representation on the right. So, so at each phase, the system makes instant choices on how to rewrite the program, such as um, um, partitioning or replicating the entire model or splitting a large operation uh, like, like Chiron covered for operator partitioning or adding synchronization mechanism between uh, shared copies of parameters. So basically this instance choices form an interpretable expression, um, like just like what, what we say in compiler instructions uh, that instructs how the original model on the left shall go through its phases and get distributed. So this representation we get is exactly the explicit form of the so-called distribute strategy of this model for this model and cluster tuple. So now we ask like, to achieve this composable workflow, um, what do we need to solve? I, I guess there are at least two questions. The first one is how can we represent such a distributed strategy explicitly uh, like, like compiler did for their intermediate representations, right? The second question is um, how can we actually implement this aspect choice uh, in a composable way? So by composable, I mean, we can choose one block from each of this category and make them compatible with each other. That is, we can assemble them freely to achieve the desired, desired strategy we want. Yeah. So this brings us to the next topics. So first, we want to develop a strategy specific in language. Second, we want to develop a composable implementations, which we call as kernels. Um, so you can understand the kernels are the algorithm that transform the model representation on the left into the distributed system in representation on the right, following a strategy specific language. Okay, so let's look at a few examples of how, on how to develop the strategy specification language first. So for each aspect, uh, we, we can actually go through many, many examples that are covered by Chirong in part two. So let's start from um, examples uh, in the computing aspect. It's specifically how to represent the partitioning uh, of a computing operation, and uh, also how to represent the placement of them on distributed computing devices. So in fact, uh, operator partitioning, also node partitioning and placement is a very well explored broad problem. Following exi existing results, we can design a simple expression to describe how a node shall be partitioned and placed. So here I offered a partitioning expression um, in the slide. So basically a partitioning expression describes how a computation or wearable node should be partitioned and dispatched onto multiple devices. So following previous results, we can use a short expression to describe like, for example, along which access we want to partition the variable or operation. So this possible access to partition along with can either be manually specified or autom automatically discovered based on uh, some other advanced techniques, but we are not going to cover that. Yeah. Uh, similarly for the placement, we can assign a device uh, on the right uh, that tell how this part of the model should be placed on. Uh, and, um, uh, so together they can form a placement expression shown uh, here. Uh, for example, this count 2 example, we place it on a device with IP 10.1.0.1 GPU zero, yeah. So a, sec a second example on developing this expression is for memory management. So we can design a replication expression that describes how a ML model weights and its intermediate results should be replicated across multiple devices. So this expression can complete can, can contain uh, two main elements. One is um, a graph element that, uh, for example, which part of the model graph we want to replicate. The second one is the replica devices, that is the destination devices that we want to replicate the graph on. Um, in this slide, uh, I give an example that we want to replicate the original machine learning program onto three nodes uh, with their IPs in the below. Yeah. So basically this short expression suffice to tell how the model should be replicated on cluster devices. And um, you know, rewriting the original machine learning program following a replication expression uh, involves making and play, like making multiple copies of the original graph and placing them on the uh, replica devices instructed in the expression. 
Um, similarly, we can de develop something for communication and computing. So in this slide, I gave an example um, about developing a synchronization expression that describes how a parameter variable should be synchronized in digital ML. So it covers some um, key um, components, including synchronizing architecture, which we can choose from parameter server or reduce or uh, uh, any other possible, like sufficient factor, sufficient factor broadcasting, any other possible synchronized architecture that is suitable for this model. And also uh, we can introduce the uh, message encoding and decoding to cover the aspect that considers to compress the message communicated between nodes. And um, similarly, we can introduce a, a element called stillness, uh, which specifies the level, level of uh, asynchrony we want to use to bridge the computation, um, et cetera. So basically rewriting the graph following this synchronizing expression just involves adding or altering the specific part of the ML program um, to reflect this synchronizing semantic. And by enumerating each atomic uh, parallel ML aspects and defining such an expression for it, we are able to actually put them together and uh, obtain a full language to specify the strategy we want to use for the target model and the cluster. Okay, now let's tackle the second problem that is um, the implementation part. So to exercise this aspect of specifications, um, we introduce a new, new concept called uh, distributed ML kernels, which you can think as a transformation function in a programming language compiler that transforms the um, repetition of user code from one status to the next following the uh, specification that is instructed in the language. Um, in that sense, um, kernel is basically an implementation of a particular uh, parallel ML aspects, and it connects to strategy language in that the specific language declares the types and arguments of that kernel implementation to be applied on the model implementation. And applying one or more kernels to the original uh, model implementation results in the desired distributed system implementation we want. Uh, that is runnable on clusters, as this figure shows. Yeah. So this slide actually give um, uh, a very complete illustration how we can apply uh, this so-called kernels and uh, covering computing aspects and memory management aspects consecutively to transform the left-hand model implementation, uh, which is essentially a linear regression program into a distributed version running on three nodes um, on the right. So by seeing this visualization, can you actually figure out what strategy we are using? Um, yes, actually we, are, we have like managed to recover a primary server strategy here uh, where we sharded the parameter of the neural regression, which uh, in this slide is W and B um, to two different nodes. Uh, but that the computation happened on three parallel devices shown on the right with their IPs. And then we synchronize the primary updates with these two primary server shards on the first and second node. So with this, in fact, we are able to follow in this composability of systems to reassemble many strategies proposed in the past systems uh, in a composable way. So this figure actually, uh, this slide actually gives the example. We can um, use this to, to express most data parallelism based systems, uh, model parallelism system, or even those more complex ones, such as uh, uh, using some sort of adaptive parallelism. So, okay, so with this strategy specific language and the definition of kernels in place, how to build such a um, composable system seems quite natural. So we introduced a system called Autodesk. So basically Autodesk is a distributed ML system that try to pursue this compiler-like architecture to lower the barrier of distributed ML. So basically Autodesk provides interface to extract some sort of model orientation from users single node machine learning program. And together with the user provided um, resource specific, specific file, which specifies the cluster setups they try to scale their job on. Um, they are together fed into the Autodesk system. So from this point, uh, a strategy builder acting like a compiler will analyze both the model and the result spec and generate a strategy expression. Uh, actually, we have, I, I just developed a strategy expression. Um, we can incorporate the different uh, preference or knowledge in the strategy builder. Uh, when generated this strategy expression, right? Which I, which I will talk about later. Um, once this strategy expression is generated, it is passed into a so-called graph transformer component, uh, which is the backend of this Autodesk system. Uh, 
it is back, uh, this, this transformer backend is um, uh, responsible for exercising this strategy. Um, so basically this transformer, graph transformer contains a lot of kernels uh, that map to the uh, atomic semantics I just presented, right? And, and we call them auto disk kernels, for example. So according to expression, these kernels will actually just rewrite the original uh, single node machine learning program. Uh, for example, if the, machine, if the model representation is a data flow graph, it will add the necessary edges, nodes, and the distributed semantics um, at a per node basis. And eventually, it will, uh, we will obtain a desired distributed system representation that runnable on clusters. Yeah. So after the transform, the um, you know, system representation has been built, uh, it is launched on clusters where the distributed graph is an RC distributed system implementation is executed by a distributed runtime. And this distribu and this distributed runtime could be TensorFlow or PyTorch or any other um, existing uh, machine learning frameworks. Okay, so I want to use this visual to contrast the workflow in Autodesk with the workflow of existing famous systems such as, such as Horowood or BadPS. So basically in Autodesk, we generate an explicit strategy for the model and the results pair and then apply the strategy to transform the original single node user program into a distributed version. But for many existing systems, determining how to distribute is coupled with their system implementation and is usually black box and cannot be chosen or changed unless you switch to another system. So compared to existing systems, this new workflow is more transparent and allows tailor-made strategies. And it also decouples the strategy itself from the low-level distributed system details. So in, the, in this Autodesk system, the strategy of a model is generated by strategy builders, which are strategy generating functions with expert knowledge. I have shown the strategy builder in a previous architecture diagram. Um, so basically the strategy builder can have many instantiations. Uh, in Autodesk, we have pre-built a, a few strategy builders that apply the existing optimization uh, offered in uh, the specialized system you can find on GitHub. Um, and these strategy builders can just generate the corresponding strategies given your model and resource. And uh, in fact, uh, this, this strategy builder will implement the power benchmark report either uh, equivalent or even better performance compared to their counterpart, uh, uh, to their con corresponding specialized systems. Yeah. Also, um, customizing, uh, customizing a new strategy builder with new optimizing techniques in Autodesk is made much simpler. Um, it can be done mostly well pattern instead of uh, writing your own distributed system. So this eliminates, eliminates the need to recreate systems when we want to perform some sort of novel optimization uh, when a new model emerges or uh, like, like I started at the, the first slide of the, this, this part. And uh, it also greatly lowers the barrier of using uh, and programming distributed ML. But however, designing or implementing a customer strategy builder even in Python um, still actually requires the users, at least the developer, developer of this uh, strategies understand uh, various parallelizing aspects and their trade-offs um, to see this difficulty. So basically this slide illustrates a notable model developed very recently called DETR um, for object detection that is essentially composed of five components. Uh, as shown in the figure, CNN transformer, encoder and decoder, uh, some other prediction heights and positional embedding. So basically each model building block exhibits different mathematical and statistical behavior. And you know, due to the increasing model composability presented in, in these models, it's very natural that you know, a, a strategy that tries to distribute the entire model might, be, might require the optimization of a sub-strategy for each sub-model building block in this, in this sort of uh, model. And the overall distribution strategy ends up with being a composition of the fitted strategy for each sub-model building block. So in a similar way, uh, when we try to distribute a particular model component that, like the transformer in BERT, uh, the multiple parallelizing aspects must be considered together as they inter interact with each other. So this interaction influences their performance against different models and cluster specifications. So manually writing and testing the effectiveness of a distributed strategy, given the possibly complex model and submodel structures, is both time and expertise demanding. Now uh, we, we 
now it comes another poss possibility to solve this problem. So what if there exists an auto strategy builder that takes model and resource as input and outputs the suitable strategy? This would greatly uh, simplify the, this process of choosing the proper uh, parallel aspects and also bypasses the needs of strong domain expertise about distributed ML or distributed systems, right? So, uh, so implementing such an auto strategy builder actually brings us to solve an optimization problem where we want to find the optimal strategy that considers multiple distributed ML aspects to maximize the a measure of goodness of our distributed ML training given the target model and cluster specification. So let's try to inspect every element in this problem. So for the objective T, which is performance, we can actually characterize it easily as a system throughput or model training convergence speed, or even uh, cloud cost if our goal is to try to reduce the cost or any other form of measure of goodness uh, when the resulting system representation is executed. Um, for this model and configuration, with recent years of development in machine learning uh, frameworks, we can represent most models as, a, for example, data flow graphs, uh, a very nice representation for models. It's also not difficult to find a description for cluster topology and setting. Um, okay, now the only missing piece is the uh, S, which is the strategy S. But with our development in the first, first and second part of this tutorial, we can actually uh, write the strategy as an explicit expression which is a composition of the, all the parallel aspects we, we, we choose to use for, for a specific model, right? So this means um, with our new inter interpretation and development, everything in this equation seems pretty ready and this optimization seems trackable uh, to solve, yeah. So naturally we can build a optimizer to automatically find good strategies. So basically the optimizer workflow is shown um, on this slide. For a given model D and a cluster specific specification R, um, the optimizer first sample strategy proposals from a space of parallel ML aspects, right? Remember that we have already identified many, many parallel as aspects and they naturally form a space. Um, but when we sample this strategy, uh, it is constrained by a few domain knowledge, such as um, maintaining a global uh, load balance across the entire cluster. And also we try to leverage some locality uh, for example, we should put uh, a communication, uh, we should put a computation together if two devices are closer to each other so we can avoid communication. Then for each sample proposal, um, we can use the, the system like Autodesk to apply this strategy and convert the original model representation into a, the, that strategy corresponding to the system representation. Um, with that system representation, we can actually launch that system representation on clusters. Uh, or we can use some other methods to estimate how this system will perform on this given resources and R and model D. And um, like I said, this estimation can be either done by launching real execution or building some sort of performance models, which I will talk about later. Uh, but now uh, let's assume that we have some way to estimate the goodness of this system representation. So based on the assessment results, we either return the highest score strategy proposal directly or if we are allocated budget to perform this sort of real execution, we can measure the true performance of certain proposals by launching real execution. And uh, even more, we, we maybe use this connective data points. That is a, a, a data point of a strategy and its performance to improve our goodness estimator. So basically we can run this optimizer by alternating between um, proposing new strategies and estimating how they will perform on a given resources R and model D until a satisfied strategy is found or the real execution budget is exhausted. So, uh, and by, re by repeating so, we can, we can eventually obtain a good strategy automatically, right? Without uh, any other human knowledge or say human involvement. But the core, core problem here is how can we cost effectively estimate the goodness of a of, a, of the system orientation T. So um, the simplest but worst solution is that we just launch real execution of that system orientation for each strategy. So considering that the strategy space is exponential and the, the solution is in fact to just simply enumerate every possibility in that space and, uh, and try it uh, while real execution, 
which is of course prohibitive. Um, but the good news is that nowadays distributed machine learning training on GPU or TPU clusters is almost all bounded by the communication speed, right? Um, but not the computation because the GPU and CPU are pretty fast, but the network bandwidth is pretty limited. Um, to estimate the runtime of a system representation, in many cases, it's just to estimate the communication time because uh, uh, like I said, it's bounded by communication. Um, communication modeling on clusters is a very well explored problem um, because we know both the model D and the, the cluster setup R. Um, we can build some sort of expert model uh, on top of existing literature uh, in network communication. So this slide actually give, give an example. We can first hand extract a few critical features uh, from the model and cluster spe spec. Uh, these features could be the size of messages to be communicated for training at a specific model between clusters, and also the information about the available bandwidth um, on each computing node of the cluster. Uh, then we just need to divide the uh, size of messages by, uh, by the available bandwidth, and we got a sense that how long it will take to communicate this message to finish one iteration of training, right? So basically, we can use this sort of expert models to tell how much time it will take to communicate the, communicate the messages for, for, for training such models on, on that cluster. And by doing so, we obtain, a, a, I would say, fair estimator. And this estimator helps us to give a sense that whether a strategy would perform well or not. Yeah, and it actually suffers our needs. However, um, the problem of an expert model is that it does not always generalize well. For example, um, when we switch the model of interest or we want to train on a different cluster setup with different types of GPUs or even different network bandwidths, uh, we probably have to manually update our expert model again and again um, because all the, all the network information or, or, or size of message changes. So uh, we ask another question, is there a better solution to build that goodness estimator? So the idea here is how about just using machine learning itself to solve this problem? Um, so basically the idea here is we can build an ML model. Uh, this ML model will take the raw model resource and strategy representation as input and try to embed these three tuples, uh, three elements in a tuple into some hidden space, uh, you know, learned. Uh, and this embedder can be learned from, uh, this embedder can be learned uh, from some, some sort of a limited amount of trial data. And uh, uh, once it finishes the embedding, it can uh, use a sort of reg regressor or some other predictor to predict the measure of goodness. Um, so basically given some real execution budget, we can train this simulator, this ML-based simulator using a limited amount of real runtime data connected from uh, using this budget. And our hope is that uh, this model can capture the intricacy between model resource and strategies. And also this model can generalize well across different cluster or uh, model types, yeah. Okay, so basically following this intuition, we can actually build an ML-based simulator and let it predict the throughput or say a goodness of a strategy when deployed on resource R and model D. And the ML simulator is, itself is an ML model uh, with its possible architecture shown in this slide. Um, it could be a simple linear model or some more complex ones such as a recurrent neural network or even graph attention models uh, that embed that strategy results and model tuple into hidden space and predict the goodness of the results. So we can train the simulator with uh, some sort of loss such as a pairwise logistic ranking loss or we can directly predict the goodness value and then use the predicted results to compile different strategy proposals. Um, we, we, do, we, we did a few experiments um, using a small amount of trial data, like 200 trials. Uh, uh, we can actually train a pretty good uh, simulator. And we found that the ML simulator can find strategies up to 60% faster than bad PS, Horrorworld, or even um, other specialized systems on various machine learning models and cluster settings. Yeah. Um, despite the performance, the key advantage here I want to highlight is First, um, obtaining, obtaining these strategies following this method is fully automatic. And it does not demand system or distributed ML expertise. Um, and it, 
with a reasonable cost, like 200 um, system representation execution traces to train that ML simulator. So second, since the system goes through a compilation pass, uh, it will make, make instance choices of parallel aspects depending on the incoming model and the resources. So that means it is not a specialized system like, like bad PS or horror world that uh, just blindly apply a fixed form of strategy to any upcoming model. Um, um, as a result, the generative strategy here is custom made. Uh, it is specifically tailored for the special uh, characteristics present in that model and cluster that we try to scale up. And more interestingly, um, we found that the simulator also transfers to larger trials, bigger models or bigger clusters. Uh, this is a core advantage compared to expert-based expert, expert -based models. So uh, what does transfer mean? Um, it means that if we train the simulator on a small model or small cluster, uh, it can still predict well the performance of strategies on larger model or even larger clusters. Um, so uh, to understand this, we can consider two following, uh, the following two cases. Uh, case one is uh, we can use a small neural network, which is cheap to evaluate on cluster. Uh, and we can connect many, many trial data to train uh, and use the trial data to train a good simulator. Uh, on this small model and a cluster pair. And hope the simulator can be directly used to infer from an unseen but bigger model on a same cluster. Uh, for example, from a transfer from a small neural network to a bigger model like a bird. Um, uh, the second case is that when we, we can use a small cluster, say a cluster of four nodes, um, on which we can evaluate the goodness of a strategy uh, that might be cheap or uh, on this small cluster, we can, we can evaluate the goodness of a strategy for a targeted model um, because this cluster is small. So basically running trials on this small cluster is much cheap, right? Um, and once we use this connected data to, um, to train a good simulator, we can use this trained simulator without further training to infer whether a strategy for that specific model is good on a big cluster. For example, uh, some sort of a, a AWS cluster that will um, take a lot of money to, to, to run. Um, and we hope that this, this simulator that trained on a small cluster can predict well on the, for the performance that running on large clusters. Yeah, this is the transfer, transferability we try to see in this, this sort of uh, machine learning based simulation. Um, but uh, the question is wh whether will it transfer? Um, actually the answer is yes. So basically this figure shows that uh, the transfer results on three target models, uh, which are all considered as big and uh, difficult to parallelize models. Um, when the simulator is pre-trained on either a small model or small cluster. Uh, for example, in the last figure, we managed to train a simulator using a three layer bird, which is a fairly small model um, on an in-house small cluster. And we, then we fix this simulator and uh, transfer the simulator uh, to a larger bird, which is called a bird base, um, which is about 10 times larger. Um, and we transfer it to, to this model running on a larger cluster on AWS. So basically using this simulator, well, we can find a 1.2 X better strategy in just 10 trials of search, uh, meaning that its speed up is actually uh, a free food, yeah. Okay, so to summarize this part, um, Following the first principles developed in previous parts, we show we are able to break existing distributed ML system artifacts into atomic compostable parallel ML building blocks. And uh, an immediate value of doing so is that we can build compostable ML systems such as an uh, uh, Autodesk following a compiler-like architecture. And um, we also went through several key components that needed to build such a compiler, distributed ML compiler. Uh, including the representations, the libraries, the language to specify strategies, and also some uh, kernel, uh, composable kernels and software implementations associated with them. So basically achieving composition at the ML system level not only simplifies the development of new distributed ML strategies, but also enables us to um, build high level algorithms to automatically find good strategies. Uh, we show that we can, um, we can build either expert models or machine learning based models to, to search over the uh, space that is spanned by our definition of distributed uh, atomic parallel MR aspects. And, and, and we, we show that by 
uh, searching over that space using this uh, trained ML simulator, we can actually achieve much better performance than those specialized systems artifacts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to handle the speaker set to Auric, which will cover uh, result scheduling for digital ML. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Hal. Yeah, you can share a screen now. Yeah. Yep, working on it. All right, I hope uh, this is fine. So yeah, um, uh, I'm going to talk about the scheduling of hardware resources uh, for distributed machine learning and how to allocate uh, resources efficiently um, across many machine learning sharing a cluster. So first of all, uh, what is resource scheduling? So resource scheduling is becoming very important uh, nowadays because more and more hardware is becoming available either in shared clusters or cloud environments uh, rather than dedicated uh, fixed clusters. And in these settings, you may have many different users who are each submitting potentially many different machine learning training jobs. Um, through some interface like Kubernetes, OpenStack, or Slurm. Uh, and, um, and these systems are uh, the ones that are deciding which resources to give these jobs. And some of the benefits of, of going through a scheduler to provision resources is um, uh, they're able to automatically uh, provision and start up resources uh, instead of having uh, you know, users manually do that. And they're able to amortize the cost of these resources uh, more efficiently across many different users and many different jobs. So the job of a resource scheduler is to allocate and balance hardware resources across many users and many different jobs. And in relation to what we've talked about so far, uh, whereas distributed strategies affect one job at a time, resource scheduling makes joint decisions for multiple jobs at a time. So this means that resource scheduling is actually covering a um, higher level, uh, but a broader set of optimizations. And uh, furthermore, the decisions made by the resource scheduler may actually affect the distributed strategy chosen by each individual job. And the strategy chosen by each individual job may in turn affect the best resource uh, scheduling decisions. So at a high level, how can we decide the resource allocations for a particular um, machine learning training job? So we can roughly do this by looking at the scalability of uh, distributed training. So here's an example of a graph that uh, is a good example of what the scalability curve looks like. So we have the number of GPUs allocated to the job on the x-axis and a throughput of the job in terms of, for example, the number of images processed per second on the, on the y-axis. So ideally, we would want to see a scalability curve that looks like the dotted line, uh, the dotted diagonal line, which means that if we double the number of GPUs, we'll double the throughput. But in reality, this doesn't really happen. And after a certain threshold of the number of GPUs, if we add uh, more GPUs to a given job, uh, then the return and in terms of the throughput diminishes. And uh, we actually have um, uh, the throughput leveling off after a certain number of GPUs. So, when we want to determine the number of resources to allocate to this particular job, first we would want to avoid allocating too many resources um, because this causes our job to, re to, to utilize these resources poorly. And in the case where we're sharing a cluster between many different jobs, uh, these extra resources could maybe be a lot better utilized by, by another job. And on the other hand, we would also like to avoid allocating too few resources uh, because at, in, in this range, the job can still efficiently make use of more resources in order to 
uh, speed up training. So, so the preferred range actually is going to depend on the current state of the cluster and which jobs are, are currently running and sharing the cluster. And, and this is a property that's dynamic. So you can think uh, during a normal workday, uh, maybe there are more jobs being submitted during uh, work hours as opposed to off hours. So what this means is that, whoops. So what this means is that the resource allocations need to be uh, what we call elastic. So overall, we can decide the resource allocations for the entire cluster by uh, optimizing a, uh, an objective function of the following form. So we essentially will want to uh, maximize the sum of the speedups for each job J that's sharing the same cluster. And we want to make this optimization over the uh, allocations to each job, which is denoted by the allocation matrix uh, capital A. And here, the elements of the allocation matrix denote the number of GPUs on a certain node allocated to a certain job. Uh, traditionally, the first step that uh, towards uh, cluster scheduling is what's called rigid scheduling. So in this scenario, each job is given a constant number of resources. And uh, when each job starts, it is not able to shrink and expand to take up different amounts of resources after it starts. And this, um, and this initial number of resources is typically uh, determined by, by the user. But however, um, rigid scheduling can be inefficient because, um, for example, in the diagram below, uh, we have a rigid green job, uh, which is blocking a rigid um, red job from running. And that results in, in a lot of uh, underutilized uh, resources. So, um, a more efficient alternative to rigid scheduling is what's called elastic scheduling. So this is a scenario where each individual machine learning job is able to dynamically shrink and expand in terms of the number of resources or the number of GPUs it uses after it starts. And in this case, the number of resources is actually determined by the scheduler instead of manually by the user. Uh, and is able to uh, dynamically adapt itself during execution. So in the diagram below, instead of having these very long periods of time where a large portion of the cluster is underutilized, um, even when there's not, uh, when there's fewer resources, oops, uh, the red job can still run because the, the, the green job is able to shrink itself uh, when the red job starts. So there are lots of use cases for elastic scheduling and uh, elasticity is leveraged by many different uh, recent resource schedulers. Um, and this is because elasticity lets the scheduler more freely adjust the number of resources for each job during runtime. So there's a lot more room for scheduling to improve. So I'm gonna go over a few examples of existing schedulers that use elastic scheduling. So first of all, uh, Slack is a recent resource scheduler that leverages elasticity to reprioritize cluster resources in favor of jobs which are currently converging very quickly. And this can be beneficial for workloads like hyperparameter tuning, where you might want a early indicator of model performance before fully training your model to, to convergence. Another example more recently is called uh, Hypersked, which also targets hyperparameter optimization workloads. And Hypersked, on the other hand, specifically targets a particular hyperparameter optimization algorithm known as Asynchronous Successive Having Algorithm, or ASHA for short. And this is an algorithm which um, initially starts out many different jobs to uh, explore different sets of hyperparameters and progressively um, uh, kills jobs which do not seem very promising. And Hypersked is able to speed up uh, 
ASHA because um, it progressively allocates more resources towards the more promising uh, jobs as they are uh, identified and make themselves known. So another use case for elastic scheduling is, um, is actually reducing the cost of running machine learning in the cloud. And this comes from the fact that most clouds, including uh, AWS, have what's called um, spot instances. So spot instances are virtual machines, which can be up to 90% cheaper uh, to rent than the regular on-demand instances. However, the trade-off is that these spot instances might be taken away at any time. So if, you're, if your machine learning program uses these spot instances, then they actually need to know how to deal with these cases when its resources uh, disappear uh, at arbitrary points in time. And, um, and although like spot instances are, could be a little bit difficult to manage, they also offer a, a very strong opportunity to reduce the cost of machine learning in the cloud. So, so Proteus is such a system which can actually manage spot instance resources for machine learning training. And it essentially augments the parameter server architecture that, that we discussed uh, previously in our tutorial uh, and augments it using backup servers so that when, uh, so that when a uh, spot instance preemption happens, uh, the running training job can re recover quickly and, and, continue, um, and continue training. And the Proteus also has a component called uh, BidBring on the left-hand side, uh, which automatically purchases spot instances for you uh, using prices which can minimize the total cost of, of training. Okay, so we established that elasticity is a very important uh, property of uh, distributed training when it comes to resource scheduling. And that's because it lets the scheduler adjust resources quickly on the fly and um, better adapt to uh, current resource conditions. So how can the elasticity actually be implemented? So one method, uh, which is the most common method and it's also the most simple method is called a checkpoint restart. So this is when, um, so say we have a, um, a model that's currently running on a cluster. When we want to reallocate its resources, we're going to uh, save its model to some kind of shared persistent storage like uh, NFS or other type of um, distributed file system. And then we're going to stop this job and then we're going to start the job again and then um, and continue training from, from where it left off, potentially uh, using a different number of resources. Um, so checkpoint restart is enough to cover about 80% of the need when it comes to elasticity. But in cases where your model is very large, you might not want to actually save all of your parameters to a file system and reload it because that can take a long time. So there are other more sophisticated ways to perform elasticity. For example, one is called over partitioning, which is implemented by a system called LITS. So LITS, um, oops. Uh, so LITS implements uh, elasticity by um, over partitioning the data parameters into a large number of logical workers and logical parameter servers. And the, these total number of executors and parameter servers don't change. However, when uh, more resources are introduced or taken away, uh, the executors and PS shards are rebalanced dynamically across machines. And in this way, uh, we're able to do elasticity without uh, saving the entire state uh, to a distributed file system and load it back again. And LITS can actually implement elasticity without loss of um, training performance. So LITS matches the raw performance of any elastic system, sorry. Um, for example, um, a recent system named Strats, uh, or uh, LITS can be actually used to implement new algorithms uh, which uh, speed up training, but is also uh, elastic in, in nature. 
So elastic scheduling itself um, may not be enough to ensure the most efficient um, uh, training for each job using the cluster, uh, because the training job itself needs to be retuned to take the most advantage of the resources it's given. So, so this is where something called co-adaptive scheduling comes in. And co-adaptive scheduling will start with a number of allocated resources. It will then predict the job scalability in terms of both its throughput and statistical efficiency. And finally, it will uh, find the optimal uh, number of resources for each, um, for each job while also tuning uh, each job to best utilize those resources in terms of uh, you know, certain hyperparameters like the batch size and, and the learning rate. And this optimization can be uh, driven using the good put metric that we uh, mentioned earlier. And this process of scheduling can be repeated on a cycle so that as new resources become available and as new jobs uh, start and as old jobs finish, uh, we're able to uh, rebalance the resources dynamically and retune each job uh, dynamically as well. And co-adaptive scheduling is implemented in a system uh, named AdaptDL, which is available as an open source project. So as we mentioned, uh, co-adaptive scheduling can be done by maximizing uh, the good put of each job. And just a recap, the good put is uh, essentially the amount of useful throughput. Uh, and it's defined as the product between the system throughput measured in the number of training examples processed by the system per second and statistical efficiency, which is measured in the uh, training progress made per uh, training example processed. And the good put, uh, for example, can be affected by factors like uh, the total amount of allocated resources and the batch size used uh, by the job. Okay, so so overall, uh, AdaptDL is a cluster scheduler which can automatically determine the best amount of resources for each job, uh, sharing a cluster, and is able to adjust that uh, number of resources on the fly. And on the other hand, AdaptDL also automatically tunes each individual job that are sharing the cluster in order to take the best advantage of uh, those resources allocated to it. And um, in order to use AdaptDL, um, you only simply need to change a few lines of code in your Python training program, and uh, AdaptDL will take over the resource scheduling and uh, training. So as a user, it's actually very easy to incorporate AdaptDL into existing training code. So first of all, um, we need to change uh, two lines to enable uh, AdaptDL to automatically adjust the batch size and the learning rate of each job. Second, uh, another two lines to enable uh, automatic elasticity. And finally, the job is submitted uh, to a training, a shared training cluster with a single command. And AdaptDL can be installed as a scheduler running on any Kubernetes cluster. And uh, after installation, any number of users may actually use the system and submit training jobs to the cluster uh, where they can be automatically scheduled uh, by AdaptDL. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, AdaptDL also has many different monitoring tools uh, for cluster administrators so that uh, you know, an organization can keep track of the utilization of its uh, cluster resources. So, so the uh, co-adaptive scheduling in AdaptDL is able to reduce the expected time it takes to train a particular model using a shared cluster. And it can reduce this uh, expected time by up to 3x. So this diagram shows as the total number of job, uh, jobs sharing a cluster increases, um, AdaptDL 
with co-adaptive scheduling is able to achieve much faster uh, job completions and uh, training times. And this improvement is due to primarily a combination of both um, uh, more intelligent resource allocations and retuning of each job using the cluster. And AdaptDL's automatic job configurations actually can beat expert configured jobs. Uh, and this is because typically expert configured jobs will um, stick with the same configuration uh, throughout its lifetime, whereas AdaptDL is able to automatically and dynamically tune them. And uh, in a particular experiment we ran using a 64 GPU cluster with 160 jobs sharing the cluster, uh, we're able to achieve um, up to uh, 2x faster expected training times when compared to more recent schedulers, uh, which are using uh, expert configured uh, jobs. Another goal when it comes to scheduling is uh, achieving better fairness when sharing a, a cluster. So, so fairness essentially wants to make sure that every job sharing the cluster is treated fairly. So you shouldn't have one job that is taking up all the resources in your cluster while another job gets nothing. Right? So, so fairness can actually be measured using a recently developed uh, metric called finish time fairness which is essentially a comparison between the training job on a shared cluster versus the same training job that uses a exclusive uh, cluster of the same size. So, um, and using this metric, we're able to show that uh, the co-adaptive scheduling in AdaptDL is able to achieve somewhere around two to five times uh, more fair resource allocations. Okay, so to summarize uh, the resource scheduling, um, we need resource scheduling when we have multiple users and multiple jobs sharing a cluster. Uh, it can be used to speed up hyperparameter optimization jobs and to achieve uh, cheaper training in cloud environments. Resource scheduling can solve three different problems, including uh, resource allocation, elasticity, and co-adaptivity. And whereas uh, rigid scheduling uh, solves the resource allocation problems, uh, elastic, el elasticity and co-adaptivity uh, is able to solve um, the scheduling problem uh, more efficiently. Uh, elasticity can be enabled in a simple way by using checkpoint restart or in a more sophisticated manner uh, by using over partitioning. And uh, AdaptDL is a co-adaptive scheduler which maximizes the collective good put of all jobs sharing a cluster and um, continuously adjusts resources and tunes jobs in order to utilize those resources better. And AdaptDL as a result is able to uh, train models uh, up, to three, uh, up to two to three times uh, faster than uh, existing schedulers. And in the next section, we're going to talk about measures of goodness. Um, and we're going to focus, and even though there are many different measures of goodness uh, possible, we're going to focus by presenting um, good put in a bit more detail. So overall, to measure the performance of machine learning, there are many different metrics we can consider, right? Depending on what objective is important to us. So for example, if, we're, if we want to measure the time to um, finish training a model, so the time to convergence, then we can use uh, what's called a good put, which is the product between system throughput and statistical efficiency. Um, and, and the compute time is, uh, can be simply expressed as the, uh, the inverse of good put. But we might also want to consider objectives like computation cost uh, in the amount of money we spend, for example, on cloud resources, or uh, user effort needed uh, by programmers uh, to implement distributed machine learning. And, uh, and these are in addition to the use rule uh, measures of goodness in machine learning, like, uh, like model accuracy and, and loss. And these metrics are often um, have trade-offs with each other. 
So for example, uh, we've mentioned that increasing the throughput often comes at the cost of decreasing statistical efficiency. Uh, using more parallel devices uh, results in diminishing returns in terms of scalability. Uh, more complicated distributed strategies can be hard to program, uh, especially when we don't have a automatic composition uh, framework available. And um, uh, the amount of time spent on uh, hyperparameter tuning um, also experiences diminishing returns in terms of the task accuracy we can achieve. So in the limited time that we have, I'm going to uh, just give a more detailed uh, presentation of good put, which is able to trade off system throughput with statistical efficiency. So, so good put again is a measure of training speed that accounts for both system related factors and statistical related factors. And it can be expressed as a product between system throughput and statistical efficiency. Um, the system throughput might be affected by factors like um, whether there are heterogeneous nodes available, uh, the speed of the network, uh, the speed of each GPU, uh, whereas the stati statistical efficiency might be affected by factors like uh, the batch size, uh, consistency model for parameter updates, uh, et cetera. And statistical efficiency and system throughput are often at odds with each other. So, when we make a decision, uh, a system level decision to improve system throughput, that often comes at the cost of decreasing statistical efficiency. Um, although it will not always decrease the statistical efficiency, there are a large number of potential system optimizations we can do uh, that will decrease statistical efficiency. So, so good put actually addresses a fundamental inadequ inadequacy of, of throughput which is the measure that's traditionally used to measure the performance of distributed systems. But throughput is, is not a great measure for machine learning because it, it can often be improved a lot uh, by reducing the statistical efficiency. Um, and, and this means that although your machine learning system might process more data faster, it might take uh, much more processing in total uh, to fully train the model. So, um, so for example, um, throughput might be increased by using asynchronous distributed training techniques, uh, which will allow, uh, which will mitigate the effect of stragglers, but also introduce staleness into the computation, which decreases statistical efficiency. And throughput may also be uh, increased by employing larger batch size. Uh, which increases scalability, but also decreases uh, statistical efficiency. So let's take a closer look at why the batch size actually affects throughput and statistical efficiency. So for example, on the left-hand side, we have a graph showing uh, model training using a small batch size. So in this case, um, we have the time taken per iteration on the y-axis uh, and the number of GPUs on the x-axis. So as we increasing the number of GPUs, although the amount of time it takes to compute gradients, which is in blue, although that time decreases, the time taken to synchronize gradients over the network might, might not. And when the batch size is small, relatively speaking, we're spending much smaller amount of time um, computing gradients as opposed to synchronizing them, uh, which means that we actually uh, will not speed up training by very much, even if we increasing, uh, increase the number of GPUs. But on the other hand, if we use a large batch size on the left-hand side, we can increase the proportion of time we spent on, on computing resources, which efficiently scales as the number of GPUs increases. But the question we have to ask as we you know, increase uh, the batch size is what effect that actually has to statistical efficiency. So on the other hand, um, statistical efficiency is not free either. And in many cases, when we 
make choices to increase statistical efficiency will actually decrease the, uh, the throughput which can be achieved by our system. And some examples of these are, um, we can increase statistical efficiency by using highly synchronized execution, uh, which decreases uh, throughput because it relies a lot more on uh, network synchronization. We can, as we uh, discussed earlier, uh, we can increase statistical efficiency by using a smaller batch size, uh, but that will um, increase the proportion of time spent on synchronizing gradients, which also decreases throughput. We can also um, increase statistical efficiency by being very careful and scheduling our model updates in a fine-grained manner. Um, and all of these different techniques will result in decreasing uh, system throughput. Uh, so this is just an example that highlights uh, the, the uh, choice of using two different batch sizes. The dotted line is a smaller batch size and a, a, uh, the blue solid line is a larger batch size. So although we can um, you know, achieve higher statistical efficiency using a smaller batch size, uh, our throughput is, is smaller. So digging a little bit deeper into the fact that increasing the batch size decreases statistical efficiency, uh, we see that um, in this diagram um, published in 2018, uh, we have the batch size used on the x-axis and the number of steps it takes to reach convergence on the y-axis. And as we increase the batch size, although initially we can decrease the number of steps used, um, to, in order to converge, it uh, eventually levels off so that when you increase the batch size too much, um, we don't actually decrease the number of iterations it takes to converge, which means that we have to compute more uh, data points in total. So although ideally uh, doubling the batch size will half the number of training steps needed to converge, the reality is that the training steps doesn't decrease uh, after a certain threshold of the batch size. And uh, each of these different batch sizes might be, uh, especially the larger batch sizes, might be very difficult to use because it uh, also requires a separately tuned learning rate to be able to uh, properly uh, utilize them. So in order to automatically perform co-adaptive scheduling, um, we use uh, the good put metric, which is the uh, uh, combination of throughput and efficiency. And by combining throughput and efficiency using uh, multiplication, we're able to capture how the system throughput and the statistical efficiency um, trade off uh, with each other. So in this formula, um, the total good put increases when the throughput increases or when the efficiency increases, but it also decreases when the throughput decreases and the efficiency decreases. And the throughput, uh, and if we make a decision that, that increases throughput and decreases statistical efficiency, uh, that change might, uh, that decision might only be worth it if the total good put uh, is increased. So uh, good put, is able to capture many different system uh, machine learning choices. For example, the throughput might capture decisions made around heterogeneity, uh, parallelization strategies, um, and the, um, the communication topology and the hardware uh, performance. Whereas uh, both throughput and efficiency might be uh, jointly affected by choices like the consistency model uh, using gradient accumulation or mixed precision training. So um, the good put can actually be modeled and predicted during training by uh, modeling the throughput and efficiency separately. So on the one hand, we're able to model the throughput uh, by, for example, um, expressing it as the, the batch size divided by the time it takes uh, per training step. And the time taken per training step can be further decomposed into the time spent 
calculating the gradients during backpropagation and the time needed to synchronize the gradients over the network. Um, the time for backpropagation can be further modeled as a linear model of the, num of the batch size used per GPU, while the synchronization time can be modeled as a, um, a linear combination of the number of GPUs needed. So when the number of GPUs increases, uh, the time it takes to do synchronization might also increase. And, and these parameters here uh, of the linear model can actually be fitted and learned uh, during runtime when, uh, when a model is being trained. Uh, furthermore, um, uh, this throughput model can capture uh, other system optimization techniques, such as weight-free backpropagation, where uh, parts of the gradient computation and synchronization actually overlap uh, with each other. And Oops, skip the slide. So, so using this way of modeling the throughput, we can actually uh, measure uh, the network time and, and, and computation time during training and fit our parameters in order to create a predictive model. So in the figures below, we show that uh, using this method, we're able to actually predict what the throughput of a system can be uh, using different number of nodes and using different batch sizes. And on the other hand, we can also try to model the statistical efficiency. And um, a more concrete definition of statistical efficiency is, um, for example, if we want to model the efficiency using a certain batch size M, it can be expressed as the amount of data needed to make a certain amount of training progress using batch size M0, which is a um, constant baseline, uh, divided by the amount of data needed to train uh, the model uh, the same amount of progress using uh, the, the given batch size M. So, so this efficiency can be predicted by using what's called uh, the preconditioned noise scale and uh, the preconditioned gradient noise scale. So uh, the preconditioned gradient noise scale is a extension over the gradient noise scale uh, published uh, very recently as well. So, uh, so the precondition gradient noise scale can be denoted as the PGNS, and as these intuitively can be thought of as the noise of the gradient divided by the signal of the stochastic gradient um, during training. So P is a preconditioner matrix, uh, whereas G is the true gradient. And sigma here is the covariance of the gradient noise. Um, for algorithms like SGD, like normal SGD, the preconditioner is the identity matrix. And the preconditioner can be similarly derived for Atom and other more adaptive types of optimizers. We can replace um, uh, G uh, with an empirical uh, estimate of the gradient. So intuitively, a larger gradient noise scale it results in, um, in a better utility of larger batch sizes, meaning that increasing the batch size will not hurt statistical efficiency uh, as much. And another interesting point is that this uh, gradient noise scale, PGNS, usually is highest when the training is close to convergence. So the statistical efficiency might actually be different uh, in the beginning of training versus the, the end of training. Uh, and we can express the statistical efficiency using the definition above uh, by using the uh, PGNS uh, according to this following formula. So by using this model to express statistical efficiency, we're also able to estimate uh, the statistical efficiency during runtime. So here's an example on the left of uh, training a image net model um, for, um, with the uh, statistical efficiency measured. So we see that near the beginning of training, the statistical efficiency is actually um, lower for larger batch sizes. Whereas uh, as we uh, progress through training near the end, uh, using a larger batch sizes typically nearly as efficient as using a smaller batch size. 
And we can also predict the statistical efficiency uh, over different batch sizes, which allows us to automatically decide which batch size is the right one to use for our job. So um, just to recap, when um, the resource allocations is fixed, as we increase the batch size, the system throughput will increase, but the statistical efficiency will decrease. So in terms of the overall good put uh, that measures the actual training performance, we have a curve that looks like the following where um, initially will increase because system throughput increases, but as the batch size gets too large, will decrease because statistical efficiency decreases. So we uh, want to find this batch size uh, that's at the peak of the good put curve. And once we have the predictive models for, um, for statistical efficiency and system throughput, and thus we can model the good put for different resource allocations and, and batch sizes, we're able to easily solve this optimization problem uh, by finding the batch size that maximizes the predicted good put for our training job. And this can be done by realizing that this function is a unimodal function of the batch size, which can be efficiently maximized using something like uh, golden section search. And um, as we use different batch sizes during training, uh, we also need to be careful about uh, retuning the learning rate, which can be done uh, using pre-existing rules, such as the linear scaling rule, which means that if we double the batch size, we should double the learning rate or the square root scaling rule, which means that if we double the batch size, we should multiply our learning rate by the square root of two, or more recently by using uh, adaptive learning rate scaling uh, rules such as uh, at a scale. So by actually utilizing the good put metric um, and measuring our training performance in terms of a product of statistical efficiency and training uh, throughput, we're able to implement, for example, um, co-adaptive resource scheduling, uh, which is able to both decide automatically the um, number of resources to allocate to each job uh, together with the batch sizes for each job that makes the best use of those uh, resources. And by doing so, uh, we can achieve uh, much faster uh, training uh, than uh, is typically uh, possible using, uh, using systems that do not consider the uh, good put metric. And furthermore, we can apply good put to optimizations um, to do with in a cloud auto scaling. So for example, uh, because, um, <clears throat> because statistical efficiency is typically lower near the beginning of training, and higher later on, what we actually want to do is to start out training with a smaller batch size and gradually uh, increase the batch size throughout training. But also because uh, larger batch sizes are easier to parallelize in terms of system throughput, this also means that in the cloud, we might want to use more resources later on in training rather than in the beginning. And by doing this, we're able to save a lot of computational resources uh, in the earlier phases of training when the statistical efficiency is typically lower. Uh, and thus, um, in, our experience, in our experiments, be able to uh, reduce the cost of training models in the cloud uh, by up to 25% uh, or, or more. OK, so that concludes the technical parts of our tutorial. Um, thank you. Uh, everyone, and I want to hand it back to um, to Hal to go over the summary for our talk and to uh, conclude our tutorial. Thanks. Yeah, um, I will give a quick summary. Um, so I'm happy to give a summary and um, wrap up the tutorial. So a core goal that we want to achieve through this. Uh, a core goal that we want to achieve through this tutorial is to 
expose the weakness of the current machine learning systems and the newer demands of future machine learning system in ML production. And to address this limitation, we try to define and formulate a core concept called the composability of distributed machine learning systems. And to do so, we first develop some mass foundations um, for building distributed machine learning systems. And then we identify the representation of elements that would compose a so-called distributed machine learning strategy and map existing papers, techniques, system artifacts following these first principles based on that formulation. And with this development, we then show we are able to build a composable distributed ML systems. And to some extent, we are also able to achieve auto prioritization of machine learning programs. And then we turn our focus to another layer of problems and go through how we should realistically measure the performance uh, goodness of distributed machine learning training and use its measures to guide the scheduling of resources for multiple concurrent distributed machine learning training jobs in a real world um, production environment. Yeah. And our views and development in this tutorial try to meet the uh, future emerging challenges that we think in the next few years for both machine learning and distributed machine learning. And here we want to point out uh, a few interesting future directions. And also we try to um, uh, like invest a lot of research effort on this by ourselves. And um, this includes um, decentralized machine learning uh, where privacy is a first class citizen. And, um, and we might need new ways of training decentralized models uh, with no strict consistency anymore. Uh, like we introduced in the consistent section and also usually uh, how a lot of assumptions that are a lot in place as well, or you already did had in, in a normal cloud-based distributed training scenario. Uh, the second uh, big topic is um, compiler architectures for distributed machine learning programs. Um, as we have talked uh, a little bit in the third part of the tutorial, uh, where we want to, where we probably need to develop a new representation of models um, and also the strategies and the auto prioritization techniques and even newer programming languages to help users to easily specify complex machine learning computation on a distributed environment. Uh, the third um, promising direction that we are uh, we look, like the whole community and us are looking at is uh, hyperparameter tuning workloads that might need to uh, uh, require some co-consideration um, of two problems. The first problem is how we can optimize the distributed strategy um, for a specific model and resource tuple, right? Uh, which we covered in the third part. And uh, the second problem is how we can optimize the computing resources scheduling for multiple concurrent jobs where each job probably has a different hyperparameter hyper setup. And this two optimizations has to be considered together uh, to efficiently uh, like find the good parameters using limited cluster resources. And finally, with new breakthroughs on building larger models like GPT-3 and uh, new techniques such as unsupervised learning techniques that uh, um, uh, being able to uh, learn from unlabeled data, uh, we observe the strong need to combine all sorts of um, parallelization techniques to achieve multidimensional parallelism and to meet the increasing demands on further scaling out the size of data and model. Okay, so for the next generation AI practitioners, how can we improve the way of building AI solutions in modern production uh, environment? Um, here we propose the Castle framework for a mature production line. Um, uh, well, Castle stands for composable, automatic, and scalable. So starting from a blueprint built on first principles, um, we believe any AI solution should be built from robust reusable components with a standard interface. And this enables different manufacturers to focus on improving the quality and also help them reduce the cost of building each component by themselves. And we expect the production of AI components, namely training and tuning to be automated instead of depending heavily on manual tuning or crafting by uh, machine learning engineers as of uh, like nowadays uh, experiments. And we want to uh, give back the valuable time to the machine learning engineers to dive more into uh, the specific domains and their specific domain specific problems. And finally, um, scalability is one of the most important aspects in reducing the cost of uh, modern factories and machine learning production. 
and an industrialized AI framework must be able to effortlessly scale these machine learning products in a resource efficient manner. So um, the current Castle project gallery is illustrated um, in this slide, where we have already built a lot of uh, projects, including um, Texar, Forte, and Stave as high level machine learning libraries for users to compose machine learning models. And we also have Autodesk for uh, distributed machine learning strategy optimization and composition. And also uh, Adaptive as the Adaptive Resource Scheduler as Auric has covered. And also another project called Tone um, as an automation tool to find hyperparameters. And uh, given this picture of Castle, we are also actually actively integrating with um, uh, other existing open source communities in machine learning, such as uh, the Ray community and the NNI community to bring our track bring our techniques to a broader group of audience. And we hope our continuous development on these castle projects can, um, can gain the community uh, more readiness to face the future emerging requirements in both machine learning and machine learning systems and, um, and try to help bring distributed machine learning into masses and into production. And all these projects are actually uh, available in the link on the top right and they are open sourced. Yeah. Um, so that's another tutorial and uh, we will upload the video recording uh, together with the slides and post them uh, on both the AAAI virtual conference website and as well as on YouTube and on our website. Uh, so I, I think it will be pretty easy to search for the materials using Google. Um, if you have any question, feel free to uh, send an email to any of the speaker, uh, any of the four of us. And also you can feel free to use the AAAI rocket chat tool uh, to post your question there and we all answer it once we see it once we see it yeah thank you cool uh thanks everyone yeah thank you very much yeah and uh, i think we can wrap up here uh thanks everyone for attending yeah okay thank you bye bye I think this should be the correct link. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to log off. Uh, uh